This is Josiah Plays Dungeons and Dragons. This is Beneath the Yawning Portal, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, a 5th edition heavy RP D&D campaign. With me are my players, Will, Knox, and Manda. We are missing one player, and that is Tiffany, and she will be here, but she's going to be a little bit late. Okay, everybody. We are ready to begin. So you are all in the Yawning Portal still. Let me move us to the Yawning Portal screen. And you've all just rested overnight in your various strange places. Midge locked in a room, laying on the floor with a fake version of herself on the bed. Katrin and Will are, or Katrin and Will, Katrin and, and Roscoe are in one room, and Sardik and Ara are in another room. Everyone has their own bed. And the night passes without any incident. Although, some of you may have some strange dreams. Those of you who are flirting with the edge of sanity. <laughs> so everyone but Ara <laughs> is what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah, basically. Although for Ara, I suppose things aren't 100% smooth because you do have the crying baby that wakes you up numerous times during the night. Yeah. But it's nothing too bad. You still managed to get enough rest. You've been given some essentially homemade baby food from yeah. the kitchen. And I can uh, just press the digitation his diaper. <laughs> So now that we're in the morning, what is everybody doing? Uh, well, uh, go ahead. Roscoe went, as soon as he woke up and realized how filthy and disgusting he was, he went to the baths. So he's dealing with that, <laughs> cleaning. Because I'm pretty sure by the end he was not only dropped to like, like, sustained enough hit point damage to kill him if it weren't for healing, the blood of other things, and Ara did clean him after the like, the sewage room encounter, but not after the intellect devourers, the bugbears, the everything else. So he's a mess and cleaning. All right, so <clears throat> Vic heats up some water for your bath so you don't have to take a cold bath. Essentially, everyone has been, had a room paid for by Romalia Haventree, and the rooms include hot baths, so you can basically take as many hot baths as you want at this point. And uh, Vic also asks Roscoe, Would you uh, like me to wash your clothes as well? Oh, uh, yeah, if, uh, if uh, you could do that in the time in the bath, I seem to have forgotten a change, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that would be nice. It is no problem. Happy to help. Uh, is there anyone who sells, you know, just regular clothes here? Or am I stuck with this? I am afraid not. Uh, there is a woman on the second tier, my Mara, my Mara Ashlock. She sells clothing, but very, very expensive. I think it's all magical. Ah, well, uh... Yeah, I guess I need it all washed. Um, excuse me for a second. Uh, would you mind like turning around or something? 
he smiles at you. He says, of course, uh, give you your privacy. Much appreciated. <laughs> I'll just leave him here then and get in the bed. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't just, like, hover around. He takes your clothes and he leaves and goes into another room. Sounds good. All right. What's everybody else doing? Uh, I would definitely wash up, uh, give the, give the, the baby Varus a bath. Okay. I'll set really all of that. It's essentially saying Roscoe doesn't have anything else <laughs> he wants to do, so, um, yeah. There are four bathtubs. So you can bath bathe at the same time as Roscoe if you wish. Okay. But there's not really privacy between them. I guess friends who bathe together stick together. It's a good bonding experience. I'll try not to make <laughs> eye contact. <laughs> okay, same. <laughs> Like, maybe, like, 15 minutes in when it's, like, like, we really should have been talking at this point, but Roscoe has, like, been overthinking it the entire time. Finally, he's like, I should probably talk to her. <laughs> Just like, uh, so, how are you? How is your sleep? Uh, spotty. Oh, I've never had a child, so I assume that's a lot, and I, I can understand. Well, <laughs> At least we, you know, made it back up, right? Or Yeah, know, but we're often. gonna go back down. <laughs> ah, but we're alive. <laughs> Strike that down as a success in our book. True. And I hold up Ferris and I'm like, and you get to live your whole life over again. Isn't that great? <laughs> Boy, how lo how old was he? Uh I think he, he was a hundred and something. He was a little older than I am. I was, I think. You know, many people would pay a lot for that. I think a lot of people would pay a lot for that, but I would pay a lot for him to not be reliving his life. Yeah, that must be hard. But we will, if all goes well, make a good deal of money down here. And, you know, we might be able to get that fixed. Hopefully. You might become powerful enough yourself to just fix it. She she kind of like looks off, like thinking about it. Um, she's not really. She doesn't think that anything that she has studied herself, she would be able to do anything to fix this. Or maybe we just get a hold of that mage and we have him fix him himself uh, he's a bit crazy so um we might be able to strike some kind of deal actually um we would have to find something he wants probably but you know what I, I think we can do that there's a lot down there and he's clearly looking for uh look for something so yeah uh, we might hopefully and but she just kind of frowns. My water got cold, and uh, I don't think he brought my clothes back yet. So, <laughs> it's a bit awkward. Actually, it stays warm. The, actually, oh, okay. the baths are magically heated. When he, so, when he went to warm up the water, you saw him... There's a series of runes... ...on the wall with a sort of engraved uh, pathway leading to each of the baths and he tapped he tapped on the runes in a in a fairly complex pattern which caused it to heat up the bath and it heated up fairly quickly and then he comes back and he does the same for Ara's bath as well this is this was the same guy that kind of eyed me before we went down the well right oh yeah Okay, so she's like holding the baby like in front of herself. <laughs> it's like a shield to like the view of her body. <laughs> yeah, he keeps his eyes on your face. Okay. When he looks at you and he says, 
would you also like your clothes, your garments washed? Uh, be very careful with them. Yes, thank you. And he looks at Roscoe and says, yours are soaking. Uh, oh, my fingers are a bit raisiny. <laughs> when will they be done? Um, about an hour. Oh boy. Well, uh... We can give you a robe to wear in the meantime, if you wish. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Yeah, so can he, I get a robe? <laughs> yeah, so he takes Ara's clothes, comes back with a couple of robes and towels. Big, fluffy towels. Ugh, like hotel towel. Yeah. Like spa towels. This place is pretty nice. It caters to a fairly affluent clientele, since adventurers tend to have a lot of coin. And then other people that like to come here just because it's cool and have a lot of money, you know? So, uh, what are you going to do with him if we're going back down? Um, I have an offer for someone to take him, but I'm just kind of trying to mull out the, the details of the situation before I agree to it. Yeah, that's fair enough. So, meanwhile, what is Sardik doing? Okay, well, I imagine Sardik probably woke up a little, you know, a little bit later than the other two, and is sort of in a, a bit of a trance for a little longer, just because he's sleeping in a place that doesn't rock and back and forth with the waves perpetually. So he's kind of enjoying that moment between being fully asleep and fully awake, sort of that semi-consciousness moment, you know, and your mind kind of wanders. And then eventually reality and the situation start to set in. And, you know, he'll wake up with a start and turn, jerk his head and think to himself, yep, I still have a dead body in the room. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> once or twice so he would get up and he would begin uh, the process of praying for his spells and communing with the Blessed Mother and asking her guidance on just the, the various spells that he would acquire he begins to ask for gentle repose and that type of thing during which he kind of realizes to himself, you know, in, in the middle of asking for Animate Dead, he realizes that that would be the opposite of what he had just asked for, so he decides to drop that one. Drops Animate Dead? Yes. Oh man, I was really hoping for zombie in the tavern drama. I was tempted to. I I would have done it if it wasn't the if it wasn't directly in conflict because I know he would have started with gentle repose. So I'm like that's just just going to be a complete. Fit. Okay. We wouldn't have any trouble passing time in the inn until Tiff got back if he did that. Though. That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> I mean, it could be declared that I've already asked for it, and I could I would go with that. So you're going to gentle repose the dead nobleman's corpse. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if they're not... That leave last 10 days, is that right? That last 10 days, yes. The target is protected from decay and can't become undead. So... I'll say that with general repose, there's no decay and the body doesn't produce any foul odors or anything. Okay, that's kind of what I read from the spell as well. I'm also going to say that with general repose on a body, it, it becomes relatively sanitary. Like, it's not going to 
spread any kind of infection or disease. Okay. So, then what do you do? Has he already gone about casting that spell? Yeah, it's done. Okay, that was a ritual casting for him. Oh, how long did that take? And Oh, a ritual casting takes like 10 extra minutes ten, or something? Yeah, 10 minutes, basically. Yeah, so that's done. But what do you do with the body after that? Probably sitting there, sitting there alone in the room with the body and arrows already gone off. You know, he kind of, it would probably be propped up in a chair or against the wall or something. And I'd kind of look at it and contemplate and go, I wish I could have delivered you to, uh, to your family, but I'm afraid you're stuck with me a bit longer, but... But I'll do right by you, I swear to Hathor. And he's just going to kind of be in a contemplative, prayer, meditative kind of state, thinking over his options. You feel the presence of Hathor around you, as you sometimes do when you pray, and you feel a comforting sensation, like Hathor approves of your actions. A smile kind of comes over his his face as he he accepts that sensation and knows that he is doing the right thing even though the forces of the world around him are, are resisting him in that endeavor all right so you're praying and doing all that and and Fixing up this corpse with the ritual. Um, we don't know what Midge is doing yet. Presumably just nothing yet. So, the bathers. How long do you stay in the bath? It stays warm. And there's as much soap and such as you wish. Um, I would, I would get out very shortly after Vic left. Um, giving us the robes and stuff. Um, I would kind of like hold Varys out and ask Roscoe to hold him while I got out. Uh, yeah, I didn't know how to hold the baby just like this. Under his, <laughs> like, and I like I hold him and I'm like just under his armpits. Like here you go. <laughs> like I can oh, just imagine he's holding oh over the, tub, the tub. Yes, you Grammy, dry, you? Do you dry the baby off or is it just dripping wet when you hand oh, it to him? <laughs> I, I try to sort of dry him off, but like he'd still be kind of wet just because I don't have the ability to like fully like get him completely dry. But like he wouldn't be like soaking and like slippery and squirmy. Okay, the baby seems to actually enjoy this whole bathing experience and doesn't cry during it. Seems pretty placid this morning. Yeah, to be fair, I think uh, Varys really liked baths, too, so... <laughs> As an adult. Nice. Repressed uh, memories of adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I will get out um, and, like, very quickly and promptly, like, um, throw a robe over myself and get a towel for... to wrap uh, Varys up in. Okay. Roscoe is like holding him with straight arms because he didn't know what to do. And just like <laughs> turned like all the way, like turned his back on Ara as she was getting out and just like holding baby Varys out <laughs> until <laughs> she's ready. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of giggles like at that. Like it's probably the first time she's really cracked a smile. And uh, she kind of giggles at that. It's almost endearing like how like clueless like a male is versus a female, even if they've never had children. <laughs> The baby looks at Roscoe with a decidedly distressed look in his little baby eyes. And he's squirming around. Oh, oh. He looks uncomfortable. And after 
about a minute of being held by Roscoe, he starts crying. Oh. All right, please. <laughs> I don't know how to start uh, this. I, like, wrap myself up in a bathrobe and uh, I grab a towel and I just kind of scoop the baby from him and, like, swaddle him in the towel and... Like, so I think the shine. deciding factor of him uh, starting to cry was like, as it looked like he was about to, Roscoe used his awakened mind feature to like telepathically like say, don't cry without really intentionally doing it and be like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And like that experience for a baby was weird enough. That that's what set him off. <laughs> yeah, the baby doesn't like that at all. I, I I thank I thank him and um I kind of scurry out of like the bath area <laughs> like with a chuckle to um go kind of dry off and prepare myself for getting dressed when our clothes are returned. Roscoe looks at like the whoever was in like the third bath and is like, look, it was my first time, <laughs> and then <laughs> walks out. <laughs> I think Tiff just came into this conversation like, what? Whoa. <laughs> hey, welcome, Tiff. Thank you. Sounds like people are taking baths. Yes, we, yes. we, we we've decided that when <laughs> friends bathe together, they stick together in dungeons. We will see if that is the case. <laughs> I think the most like diagnostic test here is if Ara and Roscoe stick together, but everyone else leaves. <laughs> Pretty nice. much. I have a feeling I know somebody who's not taking a bath this morning. <laughs> I was. I did wonder if the peer pressure would have gotten to Midge, and she would have been like, she might do like one of those bird baths where she just kind of like splashes water. <laughs> so she uses you... someone's dirty tub water. <laughs> She didn't consider the water might need to be changed. <laughs> she was in spider form in the corner during all of that. <laughs> Once we walk out. What does Midge do when she wakes yeah, does up that in count the morning? If there's, if there's just steam around, does that count? If the, does it count? What do you mean? Like if you're just in a room that had a lot of steam from hot water. Does that count as a bath? As cleaning! Uh, yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, uh, after the whole, like, dank sewer water incident, I do recall Ara, like, prestidigitating her just a little bit. So she didn't get as, like, cleaned off as everyone else did. But she did get a little bit. Ara just has this, like, mental plan, and she's not telling anyone that, like, every once in a while when she pats, <laughs> when she pats Midge on the back or something, she's kind of just giving her, like, a quick clean off so, like, the smell is not overpowering. <laughs> like, nothing noticeable enough, but, like, everybody else is like, oh, I can breathe a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Midge isn't, like purposely go like not bathe and build up a stink but even when she does like bathe or like wash or whatever she purposely wants to maintain some of that natural like defense so what is she doing in the morning um she probably would go to just like wash her face like very very quick uh, bath situation um, before going downstairs. Um, I think she wants to be like down there before anybody else is, so I don't know if anybody called back. Being down in the tavern? Yeah, before anybody else. Yeah, nobody else has gone into the tavern itself yet. Okay, yeah, because she then she would do the the bathing stuff super quickly um, earlier in the morning, and then just like be downstairs just to like be able to watch people come out. Okay, so you're just gonna sit at a table and watch. Yeah. Bonnie comes over and asks if you want breakfast or anything to drink in the morning. Uh, no thanks. Okay, have a chair away, dear. 
let me know if you need anything. Is it the morning right now? I think it should be yeah. like late night, right? Oh, that's right. It should be evening. Because we Wait. left in the morning. We're only down three hours and then slept eight hours. Yeah, because I was joking that we came back for lunch in effect. <laughs> oh, no, but didn't Josiah give us some? You gave us some time also. So, okay, no, I guess it would have only been 13 hours. Let's just call it really morning. early morning or something. It's probably a little bit easier that way. Like 3 or 4 a.m. Well, it's a 24-hour <laughs> business, so it doesn't actually matter what time it is in terms of the tavern itself. You know, they're not gonna, they're not going to be closed. Uh, they're not they really can't close. <laughs> yeah, at this I point. mean te technically they're perpetually closed until that ward is lifted. So what time do you think you went down originally? Uh, I was thinking it was morning. Yeah, I thought no, we went down went... at like 9 or 10 in the morning. Yeah, because we, we left the tavern, we went to our different places to sleep for that night, came back in the morning, formed our group again, and then went down. And we were down there for three hours. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually more like 11 o'clock at night right now. Yeah, pretty much. That's kind of what I was thinking. 11 o'clock, midnight, after like all the little bits are said and done. Kind of. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that doesn't change anything that Midge would have done. She still just sits. No, Roscoe. Uh, Roscoe doesn't really have anything of substance to do. He was just kind of wasting time until Tiff got back. <laughs> so. so. I guess it would just kind of matter like about other people if we're encountering other people. After the baths, do you guys go to the tavern? Um, I wait for my clothing. Yeah, yeah well, clothes. okay. Yeah. Your clothes come back after a little while. Okay. Yeah, once I get dressed, I would go down to the tavern and... Same for Roscoe. Do you go and join Midge at her table, or do you do something else? Oh, I would join Midge. Do you still uh, have the baby? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you, you missed bath time. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> we RP everything here. <laughs> bath time. It wasn't as awkward as it could have been. I'll take your word for it. I'll listen to it later on when it's out on YouTube. <laughs> and what does Sardic do after the praying and the corpse ritualizing and such? Once he feels himself back in tune with a nurturing mother, he'll take a nice, calm, contemplative sigh and you know, get his items, once again sling the corpse on his back, and head down to the tap. <laughs> Bring your own corpse. BYOC. <laughs> Alright, well, when you walk into the tavern with the corpse on your back, <laughs> Dernan says, What are you still doing with that thing? I thought you said you were going to take care of it. Still looks like a dead body to me. Uh, it might look like a dead body. Well, technically, it still is a dead body, but <laughs> it's much more like your friend over there is now. You'll find there's no rot. There, there's no unpleasantries at all. It's, it is protected by the grace of the divine. Hmm. Magically preserved, huh? That it is. Let me look at it. He motions you over. Sardic will go ahead and bring it over and uh, play him out. Yeah, Jen, not- Sardik is a crazy, crazy character. He's doing some crazy stuff. Jen is like, Nox, why? Uh, he- so he kind of inspects it. He says, well, it doesn't seem to be putting off any odors. It's, it does look better. 
Hold on a second. So he kind of looks over at a table that you've been to before. And he... Eh, she's kind of across the room. He wouldn't just yell for her. He, uh... Tefera, get over here! He waves over the, the, the boy that you've all had some dealings with before. Go ask Wilde to come over here. And he puts a copper nib in the boy's hand. He got it. So he goes running off. And of course, all of you can that are sitting at the other table can see all of this going on. The boy runs over to Wild, which is the cleric of Timora that you played some dice with before. Yes. And, uh... She rolls her eyes and casually gets up from the table very slowly as though it's all a great imposition. <laughs> and then strides across the tavern. And comes over to you and Durnan. To Sardik and Durnan. Can I help you? Yeah. Can you, uh... Can you verify that this corpse isn't gonna rot or... Or come back as undead or anything. So she kind of looks it over. And she nods. Yes, this does seem to have been given the repose of a deity. It won't be a problem. At least not for ten days or so. Yes, that's what I was thinking as well. It should last a ten day. Dernan says, thank you, Wild. He nods at her. Pours a drink and hands it to her. That one's on me. Wow, thank you. She does a little sort of half-bowing gesture and then goes back to her table. Dernan looks at Sardek and says, I'll tell you what. Since you've... Eliminated the problems this body might cause. I am willing to store it in the cellar. As long as you guarantee that you'll come back and... Reapply this magic every ten days. But, you're gonna have to rent the space from me. You can't keep it down there for free. It'll be a dragon a day. At first you see Sardik's faces and a smile, and then he, the, the, the happiness kind of drains from the face as he makes a slow motion of pulling out his purse and turning it inside out, and absolutely nothing comes out of it. Well, go borrow uh, it from your friends. Uh, fair enough. Uh, just as long as you don't need it immediately. Well, I, I want it before you go back down the well. All right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll go and, yep. I'll go ahead and take care of that. At, at least you've offered a space. I, I appreciate that. I was intending to come down here and beg for it, but thank you. Still don't appreciate all that attitude you gave me earlier, before a few hours ago. What I say goes around here, you got it? I wouldn't have dared defy you if it wasn't for a higher calling, and Sartical kind of gesture his hand toward the skies, indicating the divine. It was uh, not my intention to do so. He just nods. Goes back to cleaning the bar, pouring drinks, and doing his thing. So now what, everybody? Is everybody at that table now, except for Sardik? Or... Yeah, um, I think I so. Am, yeah. Did any of you order food? Yeah, Rusko would get something probably pretty cheap. Alright, yeah, just go ahead and... 
deduct the money for whatever you want off the menu there. Yeah, um, how much would it have been for the food for Varus? I'm gonna say that, uh, Arlo provides that for free. Okay. He, he's paying for it out of his own pocket because he's got a soft spot for babies. <laughs> okay. Alright, and she she would honestly be like, you don't understand how much I appreciate this. This, if I if you need compensation for anything, like she's trying to like let him know that if she he ever needs something, she's willing to help him out for the kind gesture. Yeah, because he comes out and brings some some more stuff out for the baby after he finds out that you're sitting out there. Eh, it's no problem at all. It doesn't take much. Baby doesn't eat much, and like he said, he've had three of me own. <laughs> it's kind of fun working on something a little different. Mashing things up and... She, like, she she just expresses over and over, like, her gratitude towards him. Eh, don't mention it. And she will continue to mention it, though. <laughs> okay. So he doesn't linger at the table. He goes back to work. His work is never done. Because you've got a lot of hungry people in here. Hmm. Um, Midge is gonna start, after they've all been served their food, Midge starts, like, digging around in, like, the bird's nest that is her hair, and then she, like, finds what she's looking for and pulls out, um, it looks like the sprig of a plant, and she kind of just looks at it, and then she looks at everyone else, and then she looks back at it and mutters something. <laughs> And she's gonna cast Goodberry. So now she has like a pile of okay. ten Goodberries in front of her, and she's just gonna dole out like sliding one to each person at the table. And as she does that, she says, "Make it count." Has Sardik come over and joined them at the table, or is he doing something else? He would have gone back toward the table after taking a moment to kind of mentally compose himself. And, um, yeah, he would have just gone directly. All right, so he's arriving as you're divvying up these good berries. Do you give one to him as well? I think about it, and then very slowly we'll slide a good berry toward <laughs> Sort of now, look at it. Some of you might not know what a good berry is, so... I, I don't. She's just... <sighs> Pushing some weird berries towards you. And she's not gonna explain what it does. This is so thoughtful of you. <laughs> I'll just I'll just put that in my pocket for now. I I, I copy what Roscoe's doing, because I'm I like I don't wanna offend her, but I'm not really quite sure what she's talking about. Um, I assume that she casted some sort of spell. But I also am remembering that she's still kind of weirded out with her paranoia and stuff, so I'm just like, I, I'm gonna put this in my pocket, thank you. It, it was really sweet. I, I, I'm sure I want to eat this later, you know, when we're down. <laughs> I might get hungry, yeah. Mitch just kind of like, sighs. Um, if you... Look, if you really trust me, You'll eat that when you're when you're not feeling really, really great. Ah, good thing I'm feeling so great right now. Yeah, uh, I'll keep that in mind when I'm not feeling great. Which, to be honest, will be probably when we set foot down there for the. But thank you, Mitch. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Sardic will take a seat at, you know, listening to all of this and kind of inspect the good berry and, and such, and he'll actually just go ahead and eat his now, and I'll go, oh, thank you kindly. Thank you. My uh, my great uncle was a, a famous skywriter. He used to make excellent good berries as well. 
Rosco waits for a minute to see if uh, Nox is gonna, or sorry, if Sardik is gonna like fall over or puke or anything. <laughs> Yeah, Midge just kind of shrugs when he uh, when he says that. But she does look over uh, at the baby um, and then to Ara. So what are we going to do about this guy? We can't bring him back down there. Uh, she, she nods and she says, yes, I know. And at that point, she would look up to see if the drow are in their seats or if they're like off sleeping or something or trancing. Uh, speaking oh. of people who uh, can't come back down, um, I'm actually uh, dealing with one who you might have seen me bring back up. I uh, kind of need a, a bit of a favor that I need a single dragon to kind of give him a space here. Hey, uh, I'll have a dragon. Um, also, Nox, oh, sorry, I went to bed a bit before. I wasn't feeling great last night. Um, I guess this morning, really. But we found this gem down there, and uh, I think we decided it would be the best for you. Uh, here you go. And he'll like take out the coral gem that we found and hand it over with one gold or one dragon to uh, to Nox. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. That was from the uh, that place with that that nasty ass fish statue. Yeah, I remember that. Hmm. And he'll pick up the coral and kind of inspect it and. And such as he also takes the dragon and holds it in the other hand. Ah, yeah. That's that one that was given off the light before, from what I remember. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, the coral, yeah, I thought you were talking about the, the dragon. <laughs> Don't know why you would have known about my dragon. But, um, but yeah, that's it. Um, but, uh, unless anyone has any objections, I think it's yours now. Ah, well, my thanks, fair enough, and Sardic will quickly pocket that into one of his uh, places just to keep it nice and well secured. So you can feel a bit of divine presence around this item as a cleric, and you, you sense that you could attune to it. Okay. And I re think you said that the particular divine wasn't one that was really associated with with Hathor or anything that's in that sort of realm, but it was a different sort, like a darker sort, something like that. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't feel like a comforting divine presence. It's just more of a... over you know a more of a overpowering i mean it's very minor it's not like you pick this up and it's like oh i'm holding the power right, here right. or something you know like it it's very minor but it just it doesn't feel like the same kind of divine feeling you get from hathor it feels more gotcha. like a less benevolent god And you gave him a coin, a gold coin? Yes, I did. So to answer your question, Manda, yes, the... The three drow are sitting in their usual spot. Also, none of you have seen Katrin this morning yet. In fact, when you woke up this morning, Roscoe, she wasn't there. <coughs> uh oh. I probably would have mentioned that to Ara at some point during the bath session, <laughs> um, but uh, looking around, uh, I'll let Ara or uh, Amanda deal with Ara's stuff first. But do we see her downstairs? No, you don't see her. And right now, I mean, all of the people are not in the t t the cavern right now. The whole fifty-five people are not in there. I don't want to specifically try to go through and tell you exactly which people aren't there, I mean, until it becomes relevant. But some of the people are obviously off in the rooms. 
but the three drow are there. Okay, um... I would kind of go, and I would basically tell everybody, I think this is goodbye for Varys for now. And uh, let them know that I've made my decision on what I'm going to do with them for when we go back down. And she kind of waits for anybody to ask her, like... Almost, almost kind of hoping someone talks her out of it, but knows that like it's kind of pointless to do that. Um, Mage will rouse that. Uh, you you trust those people to to watch over him? Um, she basically like she she looks up at them. She looks back at the baby, and then she looks at Midge, and she says, honestly, she says, I don't really trust anybody to take him. But uh, if something ever happens to me, at least he'll be raised with our kind. Meaning drow. Yeah, Midge would just kind of like lean back and like nod at that. Like she can, she she gets the, the I don't trust anybody and kind of understands <laughs> the whole like, this is the best of all my bad choices. Yeah, it's, it's the best of the worst. Yeah, she gets it. And uh, so she she kind of holds up Barris's little pudgy arm, and she's like, "Wait, bye bye." <laughs> Sorta, gently touch him on the head and say, "Hathor be with you in your travels, child." Before she goes, uh, I thank him, and uh, I just kind of nod to Roscoe. He seems pretty quiet about it. I think having to hold the baby for five seconds really made him uncomfortable. Traumatized. <laughs> Roscoe is having a bit of a seizure. He's back, though. <laughs> uh, what? What do I miss? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm gonna leave the baby with somebody while we go back down. Oh. Well, uh, we gotta make sure to come back then, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> More. Yes. So I, w I would make my way over to um, the drow um, probably more dressing Felrec than anybody. And I would say, I, I, I want to leave Varys with you, but I need some safeguarding before I do so. So we need to discuss a few conditions. Felrec says, good morning again, Ara. And hello to you again, Varys. What My is little dragon's that, playing with him. What is it that you need? Um. Well, I, I, I want you to realize that I'm handing him over as like a safekeeping, not to be raised. I want him restored, and that is my main goal. Um. Direct nods. To of course, of course. And. Um, I want him returned to me, regardless of my success or failure in your request. Of course he'll be returned, whenever you wish. I have no intention uh, of claiming the child, just watching over it while you were away. That, that was her biggest fear, was that, like, Felrek was like, hey, I've had kids before, let me raise your your boyfriend back to who he was to you in a hundred years. <laughs> uh, so she, she nods. Like, you can kind of see that she's relieved at that um, main comment. And um, she says, if I don't return, if you can't restore him, raise him without the knowledge of who I am. Farrak yeah. looks kind of a little bit confused by this. They tilt their head kind of and look at you curiously. And why do you want that? Because if I know Varys and if he does have any memories of me, he will try to avenge me. He will try to hunt me down. He will try to find me. 
be honest, I'm not really sure how these things work with memories. Nor am I. What memories he will have, or when he will have them, or what sense he will make of them, but I will honor your request and not mention you. But what about if he directly asks me? What if he remembers you and asks me about you? Um, as far as you know, I died. Like, she wants, she wants him to understand that, like, if she doesn't come back or if she's dead, she wants Varys to know that it's final. So, if, like, she never returns and 150 years goes by. Granted, that's a long, that's not long in elven years by any standard. But if she's gone for 150 years, like, that's his entire lifetime that he's already lived so far. So right. she just wants it to be final so that he, he's not like, I'm going to go to the Undermountain and I'm going to find her. Because in her head, that's, that's what she would do for Varys. And she knows that that's what he would do for her. All right. I understand. It will be as you wish. And then she, she looks over at the drow that is always eyeing and mean mugging elves and half elves and then she looks back at Felric and she says my two companions because she knew about the deal with uh that Varys had made about them potentially not coming back up the well oh right so she says like very clearly letting it be known to all three of them that my companions are never to be hunted or hurt so Saloon, which is the the one that hates the elves, rolls mm -hmm. his eyes and sighs. Why do you even travel with such filth? They have saved my life and they have proven worthy of this request. They'll betray you. Their kind always does. Well, if it comes to that, I can take care of myself, but I'm not going to betray, betray them for your own vendettas. So Felrek puts their hand on Saloon's shoulder and says, Calm yourself, Saloon. You really do need to get over this prejudice you have. I have known many elves and half-elves who have been honest, decent, honorable, and loyal people. If you just give them a chance, you'll see. Solon just shakes his head and doesn't say anything else. The the other one, Krebig, <laughs> the kind of muscular one, he he's been kind of checking you out again, and he says, "Is there anything I can do for you?" Keep me out of your thoughts. Uh, I'm wounded. <laughs> well, it's worse than what could happen. And she kind of like bounces <laughs> to Var Varys nice. and uh, goes to like hand him over. Like she kisses his forehead and hands him over. And she kind of gets like misty eyed a little. Do you have him like wrapped in something? I wrapped him up in the, like the the towel, like the fluffy, fuzzy towel. So he's like pretty just much wrapped up like that, like no diapers or anything. Like I've just been like, magically you're clean. <laughs> okay. He soils. So, Felrect accepts the child very carefully, very obviously knows how to hold a baby, and seems mm -hmm. quite comfortable doing so. As I said last time we spoke, I will care for Varys as though he were my own. She, uh, she kind of like sniffles and smiles and she says, thank you. I, I, I know that this is a big take on children or not easy or cheap. Well, we're not going anywhere anyway. 
Um, and then she asks that um, if for any reason or way that the ward or is dropped, um, if they can leave message of where I can find them with uh, the owner of the tavern. Of course, of course. Now, can if she we, just kind if, if I do have to leave the tavern, I will ensure that you uh, have everything you need to find me. Can she kind of just incite this whole situation a little? Sure, of course. Go ahead. You can always roll insight when you're talking to somebody. <laughs> she believes it all. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, you, you have no idea. The... Ferrect is very hard to read. Um, she just kind of leaves it at, like, she's kind of left that, like, open, open request of, like, her friends being safe, making sure she gets the baby back, and she, she won't necessarily directly threaten, but she, like, looks at the baby and she says, I will always come find you. And it's sort of like her way of, like, saying, like, even if you guys disappear, she's going to hunt you down, like... She could have been a priestess of Loth, and she's she's not going to be fucked with. Okay. The baby and actually seems very calm and and relaxed in Farrak's hands, which kind of makes her jealous. <laughs> um, but at that, like, she just she doesn't want to linger any longer. It's just going to be too emotional for her. So she like she like holds uh Varys's hand for a second and then she lets him go and she says I'll be back and she turns around and walks away. Okay, that was good. And while that's happening, back at the table you see Volo approach your table. <laughs> and he's got another man following behind him. So, of course, you all know Volo, whom you spoke to before. He approaches the table, and with him, following behind, is this man. And Volo walks up and he pats Roscoe on the shoulder. Oh, hey again, sir. How are you? Hello there! It's-a me, Volo, again! <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. I don't uh, suppose you... you found... Go ahead. Oh, no, no. By all means, please continue. I don't suppose you found any lead on that throne I asked you about, have you? Uh, so it's been no, uh, no, we haven't yet. Unfortunately, we didn't get too far. But we're going back down pretty soon, right, everyone? Yeah. That, that's back. okay. That's okay. You were not down very long. I'm sure you will find something eventually. But uh, I want to introduce you to my friend, Jalister Silvermane. He he has a little request for you, if you're willing to hear him out. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. He is a very good man. Very honest, trustworthy. He, he works for the open lord of Waterdeep. He won't mention it because he's modest, but... He works for Laryl Silverhand herself. It's kind of a big deal. The other, the man himself looks kind of embarrassed and, and awkward after having all of this being said about him. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, Jalister. Uh, my name's Roscoe. Um, and this is uh, Ara, Midge, and uh, Sardik. So he kind of looks around the table and he, he walks up and he, he extends his hand to each of you in turn to shake. Does everybody shake his hand? Yeah, Sardik will yeah. shake it. Alright, make a con save. 
Everyone? Just, just, just kidding. That was a joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. And uh, he, he nods and kind of looks each of you in the eye in turn. And he says, ah, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with me. I have a simple, simple task to ask of you, as apparently you're able to brave Undermountain in return. And Volo seems to think that you are good people. Yeah. Well, I mean, we did survive, and we're back, so it's a good sign. Mm. And he pulls out a, a stack of sealed letters in envelopes. And he says, To make a long story short, there was an adventuring group called the Fine Fellows of Daggerford, who delved into Undermountain uh, over two ten days ago and have never returned. These are summons to court. The five members of the band are wanted... Well, not wanted like criminals, but they are persons of interest in a case, and they are wanted to come to court. So... Of course, we have no idea whether or not they're still alive, but if you're down there anyway, perhaps if you run across them, you could deliver these court summons letters to them, or at least verify that they're dead. Yeah, we could we could certainly try. Um, do you have any other information about them that we could use to uh, identify them if they are, you know, dead and not able to tell us that they're the fine fellows dagger? I've never laid eyes on them myself, but Volo has interacted with them. So Volo steps up and he says, Yes, uh, I know them all. I mean, not well, but I spoke to them. Let's see, there is Kalim the Weasel. He's a human man. And he gives you a, he gives you a very detailed description of what he looks like, including what he was wearing. And then there was... <laughs> Then there was Halith Gark. He was a half elf. Uh, had the holy symbol of Joaquin, and he gives you a very detailed description of him. And then one, there was a dwarf woman, uh, Copper Stormforge. Another detailed description. And a human woman, Midna Taubert. Uh, very pretty, that one. And he gives you another description. The descriptions are very detailed. I mean, you get the impression that Volo is a person who really observes his environment and people carefully and catalogs things in his mind so that he can write about it later. And finally, there was one among them who was not very nice. He was pretty sinister, honestly. I mean, I don't like to... I don't like to apply stereotypes to races or anything, so I'm not going to say that this had anything to do with the fact that he was half work. But he happened to be a half work, and he happened to be kind of a terrible person, as far as I could tell. His name is Rex the Hammer. Although, to be honest, the, the woman Minna didn't seem very nice either. And um, we'll we keep on. Yeah, so he gives you good descriptions of each of the five people. And Jalice what was says, the what was the name of the adventuring party again? The Fine Fellows of Daggerford. I have updated the factions handout and the quests handout with all of this information. Excellent. And whatever else new stuff I had to add to update for things you found out or whatever. So those are both updated. Um, Galatia says, This case is a matter of personal importance to me, so you would have my tremendous gratitude if you could do this thing. It is my hope that they are not dead, because I need to know. And he kind of um, yeah, looks we... he kind of looks very sad and he he looks away, he breaks eye contact and seems to be kind of collecting himself. Like there's something he just doesn't want to say. 
he's he's you know I reluctant don't... to provide any more details. But then Volo just steps up. Hey, he doesn't want to talk about it. But the truth is, it's a murder case, and the one who was murdered was Jalister's boyfriend, Feral. Jalister kind of shoots him an icy look, like. We don't have to talk about that. Could you just not talk about it, Volo, please? Ah, I'm sorry, my friend. I'm sorry. I just thought they should have all the information. Wait, what do what do these guys have to do with a murder case? Like, they, they might have seen something, or...? Well, a couple of them, Midna and Rex the Hammer, were seen in the area where the murder took place around the same time. So, we want to know if maybe they were involved, or if they saw something. And we want the other three in court as well, so that we can question them and see if they heard anything from the other two, or were in any other way involved or know anything. This, this group is the only lead that we have. My, my condolences to you, uh, sir. Uh, I speak at least for myself, but I think for everyone, in saying that we will keep an eye out for them, and we will certainly give them the summons if we... Thank you so much. I'm deeply grateful. Sort of go glance at the letters and go, I, I've, I've just got one question here. They, they really, they really just give out court summonses in Elvish? What if people can't understand Elvish? <laughs> he looks at you confused, like, what are you talking about? Those letters are in common. <clears throat> well, this is a very uncommon, sort of common script, if anything. This is like, like, pseudo-Elvish common or something. Sodic, that, that is common. It most certainly is not. It, it's as it's as elvish as this menu right here. Ah, uh, if you excuse us, is it, uh, uh, Jonathan, Is there anything else that you need? I think we have a conversation to have. Uh, in just a second. No, that that is all. Please, please look for them while you're down there. And thank you so much. Uh, of course. Uh, and as he walks away, Oscar's gonna turn back to Knox. Like, uh, Knox, you, you do speak common at least. Do you know how to read it too, right? I know you're from a bit far away. Well, of course, I'm. I'm talking in common right now. It's just, uh, uh, I guess I'm not up with this, you know, posh water Davian uh, common ease that they have, and this is all with the the flowing, uh, you know. Oh, with the flowing letters and this and that. And, you know, I, I like the nice old hard dwarven runes. I guess you call me a traditionalist in that sense. Uh, Nox, this is um, this is this is normal common. Uh, Anyone? Anyone's going to help me with this? Uh, no, <laughs> what he's saying makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, this is common, but it's definitely a lot of flourishes. I I think he he has a point. I mean, I guess that's, you know, what the, what the, the hoity-toity bourgeoisie make, you know, out for the common. But I don't know, it's just, just not that, you know, the, the common layman's common. Oh. Um, I guess that's, that's pretty true then. Um, I don't know, it just, it's not that far from common, you know? It kind of is. Uh, not all of us studied at a university, alright? <laughs> I, I guess I need to check my privilege then. Uh, I, 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 lo I look at... Uh, Roscoe at this point and I'm like it, it's definitely elvish at least the script looks similar and I blink at him like let's just move on from this conversation for now yeah trust a half elf to know he's elven 
Yeah. And I, I, I kind of give the, the, the snutty will I am a full elf. <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to make it like that. Um, anyway, yes, moving on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, is everyone good to go down? At this point, Katrin walks up to the table. It's the first time you've seen her uh. this morning. She plops down in a seat and she's got a coin purse in her hands. And she dumps it out on the table and starts counting coins. There's some gold, silver, and copper in there. Katrin? Looks like someone's been busy. Who's your oh, Rob? hey! Good morning. Oh, wait, no, I had this before. I just... I, I was lost among my things. I forgot where I'd put it. But I looked through my stuff carefully and I found it. Ah. I don't trust her. Can I insight check that? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. What are you whispering about, Midge? <laughs> don't worry. Hey, you mind your own business. <laughs> Dang, girl. Okay. No. She has a minus one to deception. She's not good at it, but I just rolled a 20. <laughs> I mean, she's Checks used out. to talking about where she got her things from. She just lost her gold coin really far into her stuff. So far, in fact, that it was not. You just happen to have a lot of gold coin we didn't know about before. Not a big deal. That's I had a similar a thing happen this morning. I was counting my iron spikes, and I noticed I was one short, and then I realized that it had just rolled under the table. Just, just rolled right off. But then I was able to find it and, you know, brought it back with the others. Back with the herd. Four hours! These are the bunch of fucking nuts! <laughs> what? What did you just say? A bunch of nuts? Yes! <laughs> Some of us will be normal again sooner than others, alright? Oh, thank god. Some of us have a downhill slope. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katrin waves uh, Mash over, who comes over. What can I do for you? He says, yeah, um, I, I want some food. Can I get some roast rothe, um, and oh, oh, and a hot sausage and sauce, and um, also uh, some soup, oh, and a pork pie, and some potatoes. I don't think we're leaving today, guys. Uh, you can <laughs> eat all that. Uh, yeah, I'm hungry. I worked up an appetite down there. I'm gonna look at Mash though and be like, uh, oh, let's let's get half of that to go. Mash says, that's very fine choice. All of those <laughs> things are very popular. <laughs> and she says, um, just water to drink, but a but a big thing of it. If I look okay. around, are those um those those are the red sabers around? No, they're not, actually. Cool, I ain't even worried about that. They went down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping they come back before we do. Before we go down. Ara doesn't have a baby in her hands anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Swing on. So she says, what have you guys been up to? I was just, you know, really, um, looking through my stuff a lot. Yeah, your stuff was out of the room a bit early. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we took, we cleaned up, you know? Uh. Katrin has not had a bath. You can, you can tell. Um... Uh, well, Katrin, are you, you getting close to ready to head back down? Because uh, I think we're all rested up and got our business taken care of. Uh, I guess we'll wait for your food. Yeah, yeah, that's alright. I can eat this stuff, you know, on the go. Sorry if I held you up. You're fine. We Say, all have hey, things we what, had to take care of. Wh what happened to the baby? I found someone to take care of him for now. And she kind of, like, gives a sideways look up at the drow. 
Okay, well, great. It's That's good. It would have been a bad idea to take him down there with us. It would have. So, does Sardik go back over and pay Dernan the one dragon to store the body? Yeah, he would go ahead and do that. Alright, so he has you drag the body down into the cellar. Sardik will do that happily. Shows you a spot to put it. And says it's so gonna be another dragon every day, so... You can just pay me the one for now, but when you come back out of the well, I'm gonna charge you for however long it's been. Alright, fair enough. Fair enough, it shall be done. So that's the end of that conversation, as far as Durden's concerned. He goes back to his, his job. So the food comes out, Katrin kind of wolfs down half of it really fast and then takes the rest to go. She says, okay. Thanks for waiting, I'm ready. Man, that really hit the spot, I feel a lot better now. I feel like I just gained like 18 hit points. <laughs> nice. Odd, odd you would phrase it like that. No, she doesn't say that. I know, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, is, uh, everyone good to go down? I guess so. I'm yeah. ready. Yes, I feel rather lightened of my burdens. I'm ready to continue. Well, uh, oh, Midge, are you good then? Yeah. All right, <laughs> back in so soon. Uh, Roscoe is gonna walk over to Dernan and say, I, I, "I think we're headed back down now." Um, actually, is the the dude who paid our travel down still in the bar? No, he's also not here right now. I can pay for our travel down. Oh, I, I can cover myself at least. Um, Oh, well, I it's a dragon apiece. Up. So if the, all five of you are going, that's five dragons. Ah, uh, yeah, Midge would pay for her own also. Okay. I'll Catherine pay for Sardis. Catherine out of gold. She says, I can pay for mine. She seems sort of strangely proud of the fact that she can pay for herself. <laughs> um, I pay for Sardix and my own. Uh, my thanks. Much appreciated. And I guess we all jump down face first. <laughs> yeah, so you can all ride down together now. Now that Dernan has repaired the platform that goes down, which was in disrepair <laughs> before, but now he's got it working again. It's a little bit rickety, but he assures you that it's perfectly safe. This thing could always use some nice dwarven craftsmanship to kind of shore it up a bit. Well, maybe we can talk about that. But for now, everybody's going down, right? Yes, sir. So he yells out, Delver's going down the well! Again! And some people <laughs> in the... And some people in the tavern cheer and raise drinks. And the betting begins among oh. various people as to whether or not you'll come back. But this time there's no heckling, because none of the members of Red Saber seem to be in attendance. Which is unfortunate. Sort of thaumaturge for a second and be, Peace be with you all! As we descend. <laughs> at, at triple volume. Nice. Everyone in the well is cringing and like trying to cover their ears. Yeah. Not to mention us who are like right next to him. That's what I meant, us in the well. 
Nice. Oh, oh, oh I see. Yep. <laughs> so, down you go. Yes, sir. Down we go. Again. Alright, you descend down the 140-foot shaft again, slowly. It takes a couple of minutes. It's slower now that you're all going down at once. That doesn't make much sense, but it, does, it is anyway. We'll go with it. Yeah. DM, DM said it. He has to lower it more carefully now to avoid, like, you know, any mishaps with the platform. And you arrive back in the well room with the sand on the floor and... Oh, it doesn't have a dead noble body there anymore. I gotta no remove that noble. guy be no. because you have... Uh, Here's another actually... one. I don't know though. To be fair, Josiah, we're at least eight hours where we were asleep. There's plenty of time for another noble to have jumped down. True. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to at this point. Okay. The performance should be better now because they did an update which improved the performance with the uh, with the uh, um, advanced fog of war, and it seems a lot better on my end. So hopefully. Scrolling around and stuff isn't as, you know, sluggish. I think so on my end too. Um, we can see a little bit more from this of room than we used to. Yeah. Um, like I can see up to here, which doesn't really affect much. But, and we kind of knew there was a passage back here from the shield anyway. Um, but we just so you know that we can see up into here. Oh uh, yeah, that's yeah. weird. I we actually see post... way over here. Yeah, I can see. I'm looking at... I can see your view if I click on your token and hit Control l mm -hmm. And you guys can see a bunch of stuff that you shouldn't really be able to see. Let me try something. Yeah, that did... Limit. Much better. It means that we can't see things that we've already explored before, so... Yeah, but we're, I'm going to move your token back through those areas anyway, and then, yeah. you'll be, then you will be able to. Okay. So, um, what I want to do is, since we're when we're in kind of narrative traveling mode and not actually moving, you know, square by square, I'm just going to stack all of your tokens in one stack so that I can easily just kind of move you through and put you in places. And then when it becomes relevant, we will determine where everybody actually is relative to each other. All right, sounds good. Works for me. So, what are you guys doing? Katrin gets her shield out, it starts, or get, not gets it out, it's always on her arm, but it's in, you normally it's in that sort of small mode, and so she makes it kind of grow to full size and it starts slightly glowing. Now you gave the coral to Sardic, right? Yes. So um, that means... The Rusk now has um, Devil Sight, so he has 120 feet of unobstructed dark vision. Are you are you not going to light the lantern then? Um, I think because everyone else still kind of needs it, I, I will. Know. But uh, so everyone else sees it as dim light. Roscoe doesn't even see it as dim light. Right. Right. I guess you have the perfect difference. vision, even in the dark. No. Oh. Um. So, I'll leave it on for everyone else to be in full light. But um, I guess as far as like that goes for Roscoe detecting things. Yeah. Let me change your vision on your token. Okay. 
It's 120 feet, right? Yep. Yeah, you functionally have 120 feet of bright light. It's not real light, but for you, it's like it's bright light. If someone turned the lights on in here a bit more than what I last remember. Or just arches a brow and she's like, okay. Oh, I and also, like, it sure if, is. If anyone, like, looks at Roscoe's eyes, they look a little bit weird from before. Like, one of the pupils is, like, slightly larger and kind of blown and there's, like, darkness around it. And if you look, like, really close, there's, like, a bit of, like, a sort of, like, faint green glow from his iris that wasn't there before. Um, and this is just kind of in one eye, if anyone is, like, stopping to really look. Katrin says, what happened to your eyes? It, nothing. I don't know why you'd say that. They look different. Well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think anything happened. I'm going to say another three hours just passed in the tavern with everybody bathing and waiting on their clothes and hanging out and talking to people and whatever, waiting for food, etc. So that means you are... I'm at 16 of 30. We're more than halfway there, folks. Yeah, you've only got 14 hours of extreme paranoia left. I gotta make nice. the most of it. Okay, as we're walking, um, Midge is obviously going to hang in the back a bit. Who would be in the back with her? Roscoe's been hanging by the back, so unless anyone's stopping him. Yeah, Ira's probably like in the middle. That's what I thought. Um, at some point as we're walking through these like hallways that we've already traveled, um, probably like after uh, Katrin points out the that Roscoe's eyes look different, Midge is gonna like wait a beat and then she's just gonna sidle on up to Roscoe and then whisper, I know your secret. <laughs> and he's gonna keep walking. Nice. nice. Roscoe's gonna like stop for a second to try and process and like lose her a bit because she started walking away and be like, uh, uh, uh okay. <laughs> I'm just... So it's about midnight now, also. I mean, not that you guys have clocks or can even see outside so you really have no concept of what time it is you know specifically but i tell my time by spells all right so is uh is Sardik kind of walking up in front with katrin yeah all right and you guys are, I assume, are you moving at full speed or are you moving at half speed and performing a sort of cursory search of your environment as you go? I would like to check and make sure the shield, because I had switched the shield that had the whole board in it with a shield that didn't. Did that get replayed? Nope. It's still okay. as you left it. All right, cool. Um, I would still like to move slow, but... Yeah, considering all the bizarre things that have happened in such a short distance, I don't think we'd just charge in full speed. I'm just gonna say, so far, so good. Alright, so you make your way back down the first short hallway, and as you do, you see dust on the wall and the words Halastra must die written in it as though with a finger and then it sort of shivers for a moment and falls away 
But then it doesn't do anything else. You just saw Halastra must die and no other messages. And now we've got elvish spirits. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is elven. I think that was actually Goblin, and I nudge him. Are you really, like, promoting this? <laughs> Nobody else thinks this is weird. I right. think it's weird, but there's really no point in fighting it. He is convinced. Uh, Alright, alright. Have you ever <laughs> stopped to consider maybe it's all an act, and he just wants us to think he can't read? Well, I mean, so far the only thing he's had issues reading is the menu, the something on the wall, and a summons that has nothing to do with him. He's just laying the groundwork. It's okay. Who, who's carrying the letters? I'll say I will. I was. Okay. <laughs> like no one took them, so I'll also just say I. Did. <laughs> we just left them on the table. <laughs> yeah, <they're laughs> like sure, Jalister, we got them. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah. yeah, we'll deliver these to the trash. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Recycle bin. <laughs> ha, you lost a loved one. Sucks. <laughs> I mean, you know, nothing's stopping you from just coming up in a few hours and being like, yeah, we found them. They're all dead. So, yeah, bye. But yeah. <laughs> I suspect you're not going to probably do that. Changing uh, my line no. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I added another quest. You might have noticed if you looked at the quest handout. So you have all the quests that you had before. And I added Mytholing Persons, which is the quest to possibly find something that could fix the quasi-mythal and thus oh, allow the one you that to leave Remy. Them. Yeah, and then okay. subterranean subpoenas, which is the quest for the to deliver the letters. So now even more quests. So you're just proceeding back the way you came. The way I mean, there's no other way you could go. So I don't know what I'm asking, but. <laughs> yeah, essentially back to yeah. the pillar room at least, because that's where we saw the the vampire. The vampire. Last. Yeah. All right. So, as you enter the hallway with all of the carved bas reliefs of the different demons on the walls, you notice that the secret door that you opened to the south is now closed and I actually haven't actually closed it off for the purposes of dynamic lighting so it'll look to you on the map like it's open but it actually is closed and ahead of you as you approach the pillar room you hear some disgusting slurping and and grinding and smacking kind of wet, horrible sounds. And you can see just past the bulk of the pillars that uh, there are some massive worm-like creatures feasting upon the bodies of the dead bugbears. And you can see that it looks like some of the bodies have been dragged, leaving trails of blood behind them, dragged to other locations than where they strictly fell. The bodies of the intellect of ours seem to be completely gone. Although well, they were tiny, so... Yeah, they weren't very big. They were the order of... Yeah, that's what I was gonna say! <laughs> Oh. Um. How close does this sound? Oh, you guys see that? Ugh. Cute. Yeah. That just made That's me like cringe. Like. Yeah, they're these nasty worm-like things with like a bunch of tentacles. Ooh, is this uh, a new beast form for Midge? <laughs> is, it, is it a beast or is it like a monstrosity? Or a monster? It's probably a monstrosity, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a beast. 
Mid season is like, thing? wait, I can join you guys. Can you imagine that thing spying on you? Like you wake up in your room and it's just in the corner. <laughs> it is I, Mid King of the Carrion Crawlers. Um, so now at this point, since you've seen creatures I had, we'll go ahead and break out the tokens into their proper locations. So just kind of put yourself wherever you want to be at this point. Do we want more distance between our, our rows here? Yeah, I think I would... this is fine. Unless... Yeah, it looks good to me. Yeah. Alright, so... So far, the creatures don't seem to have any reaction to your presence at the distance that you are now. So what do you do? Um, we should probably deal with them, right? Right? Yeah. You get on that, Rasko. Uh, oh, that was a very solid we. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, all of us. I could, like, sneak up and try and look a bit closer. But, I mean, I think we know kind of what's there. Yeah. Um. I, I guess our best bet would be to kind of sneak up on them and... Actually, so technically Roscoe's dark vision goes... <coughs> I can't see on the map, but can Roscoe make out how many of them there are? I'm not sure why your dark vision isn't going the full distance that it should. I don't think mine actually is either. I set it to 120 feet with no dimming. Oh, the squares probably aren't five foot squares. It might be um, no, they're set five to a different feet. ratio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I can only see up to 65 feet. Yeah, yours says it's 120 as well. Well, maybe there's just something blocking your... Um... Is, is it maybe that elevation change that's doing something? That's I moved over to see if that was the case. Elevation it's, change. So for me, there's like the a, a flat line right here, where nothing passes this flat line. So is there a um, is there something that blocks um, vision right here? Well, there's yeah, those no. pillars. Oh yeah, yeah same. But, no, but yeah. they're like it looks like a solid I... line of light. Oh, there it's gone. Oh, so that light right there is actually just from the. Um, that is just from the lantern. I don't think we're getting light from anyone else. Right here, this is as far as I see. No, I, there was like a solid block a moment ago. Yeah, so my That's lantern gone. is making solid lines when I move it around, but I don't see anything from Roscoe's vision. Yeah, like when I click on your token, uh, Manda, it tells me you can see all the way over to here. No, like, that's right 60 feet exactly from where I'm I'm at, as, as far as I can see. Before, I could actually see all the way down that hall. So Roscoe can't actually see without the lantern. Oh, wait, no, he can. Just not much. Let me just try changing it and then changing it back, and maybe it'll fix it. I'm going to refresh my page, too, and see if that helps. Either way, while this is going down, can we see how many of them there are between all of vision that we...
Did anything change for Ara? Um, no. Maybe try, um, exiting and coming back in to roll 20 real quick. Hold on, I, I gotta call Saito and get him to reinstall his Discord. That's clearly the That's problem true. there. That's true. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I just refreshed and it didn't help, but I'm not super worried about it right now. Um, I'm not, except for the fact that we should, like, where we are, we should be able to see, because those pillars, um, carrions are large creatures, so even with those pillars, we'd still be able to see part of their bodies. Yeah, and where the light cuts off for me isn't directly cut off by pillars. Like, the, the pillars are making shadows, the two yeah. that I have um, bright vision of. But my dim and we're on is... an elevation, so we should still be able to see downward anyway. So even if the the semantics of where you're standing versus where the lighting would be, we should still be able to see directly across that hall, past the like past the pillars that are that opening in the pillars. Yeah, when I click on your tokens and I do the thing to show me your view, it shows me that at least Roscoe and Ara can see. Like halfway down that long hallway to the west, but so my, you're saying that you can't see that. Yeah, yeah, my bright vision stops around the first two pillars, and my dim vision stops around sort of like the the third row. Maybe it is a scaling thing. No, because if you have the block set for five feet per. Thing, it would automatically adjust to uh, whatever set for the um, character by its feet. So, like, if each block was 10 feet, it would only give me the 60 blocks. So, if we move up, it won't be a problem right now. Um, this is something that we might be able to figure out in the down. But it wasn't doing this before, right? I've in never the, had the last time. Feet. The no. last time I had, I had no issue because that's how I ended up being able to do the fireball was I could actually see where the bugbear went down that okay, hall. Okay, this must be because of the update they did then. Damn updates. Can you try, um, you don't have to double Roscoe's view, but if you just change Roscoe's view, I just want to see if that will change for me. I just did it. I just changed it back to 60 and then back to 120 and it didn't apparently do anything. Do you mind try putting it to 240 just to see if that, if it's like just a half thing? What I, what I'm seeing for me is... That just fixed it, yeah. That my, got me to 120. Oh, yeah, because my vision right now is, um, a, I can see up to the 100 feet from where I'm standing. But it's like the already viewed vision, it's not actual like full on vision of what's in the room. So whatever you did now just gave me an even 120. The last square I can see in this path right here is 120 feet away. Okay, so I just doubled it, and I just doubled. Yeah, Aura now as I well. can I can see now. What? Can, how far can Midge see? Um, it should be 60 okay. feet. I'll move the lantern so the uh, lantern's already gone. Yeah. All right, well, if I ever start seeing past 120 feet, I'll let you know, but for now, having it double is working. Okay, yeah, roll 20 is being weird, I guess. It could be because of whatever they changed with Advanced Fog of War, somehow messing with it, I don't... Well... Here, let me turn Advanced Fog of War off for a second and see what that does. That actually yeah. that actually changed it to what it should be. Um, Mine didn't change the distance. It just took out things we had seen. Yeah. I can see, like, barely up to the stairs. Which is what your vision should be, I believe. So, I've got 60 feet. 
Oh, okay. So you should be able to see to. I think right Sardis there. needs to be doubled too. I think right now, for some reason, it's just half of what it should be. Um, like the the inputted value is only half of what's coming. This yeah, I see it. I see up to here right now, and I don't see like the already viewed stuff. Like it like automatically just blocks out everywhere that we have been, uh, versus the ability to see like like almost like a a generic version of the map yeah i think it just took off the bit of memory of what was before it didn't change distances for me but now like it's 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 bright where the um where katrin is because i guess she's giving off light um yeah, she's actually giving off a little bit of light i mean it's not that big of a deal like we're obviously pretty good at like not meta with the uh sections that we can see but it does that whatever you just did revealed all of the stuff like the over here and i still kind of like oh wait you can see up there i can't yeah. see anything over yeah i don't see anything there either Yeah, well, roll 20 is obviously not perfect. Ideally, everything would, the visions would all be perfect, but how far can Sardik see? He can see to the bottom of the stairs. Okay, I so think I, if you double, double everyone's also. vision, that will functionally work. Uh. Alright, so if I double Sardik's vision... And Midge, you can't see the full 60 either. I'm not sure what, I, what I'm what i seeing, what I'm not seeing. I can see the stairs, I can see pillars and stuff, but then it's like everything oh. starting from here is in like gray. I think Midge is actually correct then. Well, if it's in gray, you're not actually seeing it. That's just the advanced fog of war showing you areas you've already seen. Is Advanced Power of War back on? Yeah, I turned it back on. Oh, okay. Hold on, let me move your character for a second. So if Midge is here, how far can you see now? In, like, bright. Um, not, not I mean, bright. I can see there's light over there. Oh, right, there's light. Probably only 30 feet then. The Maybe corner over here. Okay, so I do need to get my keys also. Alright, everybody's doubled. Katrin doesn't have dark vision, so... I don't know if it applies to the light sources, too. I think the light sources have to be doubled also. Even like the dim, the start of dim thing isn't really working right. Yeah, something about this whole thing is messed up. Yeah, I've been having issues with it too on uh, my game. So, it's new. All right, well, let's well just we have on. enough everybody's, that we can make it work. Everybody's yeah, his light vision is doubled for now, which should be a good enough solution for the moment. So, the question then is, what do you do? Katrin says, those things are disgusting. Why does everything down here have to be disgusting? Because this, this is where we put disgusting things. Why can't we, like, fight some murderous bunny rabbits or something? Because then you'd be terrified of bunny rabbits for the rest of your life. And there was a play about that, and it actually 
killed a bunch of people, so you know, I'll take these if I'm at a spawning rabbit. I don't want to hear about your plays. The last play we talked about almost killed us. <laughs> it's a pretty funny one, to be honest, but mm -hmm. okay, I'll stop, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, probably an elvish anyway. <laughs> hey now. Oh, I can't even <laughs> with you. <laughs> anyway, we should definitely, you know, get these things out of the way. Alright, so. Uh, Ara wants to move up. She's just going to stand here. We're also just going to kind of like stealthily move in case that uh, makes a difference. Stealthily while carrying the lantern? Yeah, the lantern. I mean, you can move quietly, sure, but it's not like you're not going to be noticeable carrying a lantern. That's fair. That's fair. Ara's going to just kind of whisper uh, from here. I can see three really big, gross looking things. Uh, I'm going to leave the lantern right back here. It will give us vision in that area, I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing just fine without it, to be honest. Um, unless anyone has an objection, uh, I'll just leave it right there for now. She's so used to her dark vision that she doesn't even, like, it doesn't even bother her to not have bright, bright light. So Katrin starts creeping forward stealthily, quote-unquote. I mean, quietly. Again, there's nothing to hide behind here. And so, the uh, tunnel is bathed with light, so... This is um, fair. Ara asks everyone to kind of stand back. Um, okay. Like, she doesn't want anybody in her line right now. Oh yeah, that's plenty of room. And she is just going to cast that. Fireball? Uh, lightning no, bolt. lightning bolt. So it's a line of a hundred feet. Anything within the five, like five foot of that hunt, like that one line, takes the attack. So it's basically just the two in that straight line. Okay. Yeah, and you can s thread the needle between those two pillars, no problem. Mm-hmm. So you fire off a lightning bolt. Um. And I mean, technically, with this one. Would he get hit because of this area right here? This one? Or would it not? I'm always confused about the spacing when it comes to larger or small characters. No. He I technically don't... occupies. Um... There's no way to hit all three of them without hitting that, a pillar. That's fine. That's oh fine. yeah, he's a large creature, but he's like not on the squares perfectly. So yeah, he's not. Yeah. He would. So just those two, and okay, they have to well, make a deck save. Let's make some saves. Um, deck save. One failed. One succeeded. So, 27 for 1, and 14, I think? Is it is it rounded up or rounded down for half? I think everything in D&D rounds. No, some rounds up. Yeah, it's rounded down. So, um, okay. instead of set 27, he takes 13. 13. Alright, so you whip off a lightning bolt. I'm going to call this a surprise round, so that's... <laughs> You can go ahead and move as well if you wish after casting the lightning bolt if you want to. Um. No, I think I'll just stand there and wait for it to be officially my turn. All right, so we're gonna um, roll initiative now, everybody. the problem with rogues you get crazy initiative but it happens so that you can't get anyone nearby for a sneak attack don't you 
Don't you have like a first strike type of thing as a uh, maybe fifth edition? No, you have to be an assassin that. for that. Yeah, yeah assassin, you have to be an assassin is if they haven't taken their other... turn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we got a 22 for Midge, a 25 for Roscoe, a 7 for Ara, a 7 for Sardic. <laughs> so, Ara, I'm going to say that your turn, you've already taken it by casting that lightning bolt, essentially. Everybody else can take a turn, and since it's the surprise round... This initiative will take effect as soon as we hit the first round of combat, but for the surprise mm -hmm. round, you guys can act in whatever order you want. So Ara started off, essentially. Yeah, Ara just didn't want anybody, like, stepping in front of her or beside her uh, to take any damage, because that is anything within that spell range. All right, so your lightning bolt flashes through the air and there's a sizzling sound as it sears the flesh of these horrific creatures and they let out oh, a they sound <laughs> and now my throat is destroyed forever does one one look more hurt than the other i would assume Yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of hard to assess how hurt they are at this point from this distance and without maybe knowing much about the creatures, but you think you hit the one closer to you more solidly Okay. with the bolt, and then the other one kind of seemed to avoid it a little bit better. All right, that's all. I was just more wondering. Um... So, for maybe other people's benefits. So you're going to stand where you are? You're going to stay where you are? Uh, yeah, for now. Okay. Anybody else that wants to act during the surprise round can do so. You don't have to follow initiative order. Uh, Midge would cast Shillelagh on her staff then. And probably move up a little bit. Ah, oh, there we go. I can see things. Oh, girl. Maybe they were peaceful. Maybe you could have just walked right past them. But no, you gotta start a fight. They were already feeding on something. Yeah, they didn't sound peaceful. I would say that Midge has seen a carrion crawler before. Cool, but I know that they're not pro peaceful. Yeah, well, they, they're constantly hungry and they eat bodies. And if they don't have bodies to eat, then they eat people they that are bodies. alive. Yeah, they make <laughs> bodies. But um, they're not super aggressive if they're already eating something. Unless you get too close to them, as far as you know. Midge probably has never actually killed one, but she's probably had to defend herself against one and sort of get away. Because they're they're pretty they're pretty dangerous, pretty tough, as you as you recall. Meanwhile, uh, Katrin, I guess, will look around at everybody. So we're just, we're going to fight him? We're going in there? A bit late to question that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Katrin, go. Go for it. You got Hara's got some aggression. <laughs> it seems the battle's been joined, lass. I got this. <laughs> so she <laughs> pulls out her dagger. Oh, no. She flies into a rage. Everyone Die, creepy things! Way. <laughs> she flies into a rage and just goes running in. Let's see, her speed is... Oh, she's got cunning action. I keep forgetting she's part rogue. She's not just a barbarian. So she can dash as a bonus action. Oh, but she had to use a bonus action to do rage. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she just has normal movement. That's about as far as she can get on a single move. 
course, she could now dash as her... Oh, no, she's just going to throw a dagger through that little space between these two pillars at, and hit that one that you already hit with the lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. Runs up, throws a dagger. That hits. I don't think she gets sneak attack, though, because she doesn't have advantage for any reason. So it just does six damage. Her dagger sort of rips a little gash across the side of the creature. Doesn't look like it hurts it very much. All right, Roscoe will step up and with coming action use a dash action. So. And he calls out, oh, there's another one up in the hallway. Uh, and with his action, he's going to attack this one here. Um, and because he's a swashbuckler and there's no other enemy within five feet of him, he does get sneak attack, but not advantage. Okay. Uh oh, there's a 12 hit. A 12 does not hit. Well, well. It, it, uh, has, it has sort of thick, rubbery hide, and your rapier just doesn't penetrate it. You know, you think you're going to have to stab harder. All right, um, and then with my last five feet of movement, I'm going to step this last five foot back. And take what cover I can from the pillars. Okay. Cover does apply to melee, so because we looked that up before. Uh, right. That means everyone... Oh, Sardik, have you done anything on the surprise run? Not yet. Uh, Sardik will follow in Katrin's wake as far as he can, which brings him to there. And he will call out to the one that uh, Roscoe just struck, who hasn't quite dead yet, I and he'll intone, Ye who seek to feed on death, death seeks to feed on you. And he will go ahead and cause a bell to ring within the creature's mind. Tolling the dead on the, the one next to Roscoe? Yes. Okay. Whoa, 21 damage? If it's... Holy shit. Okay, let's see if it makes it save. That was a roll right there. Mm-hmm. It did not make it save. So, that is a grip of, tw of necrotic damage. In fact, that's enough to kill it, so tell us how this looks. So, Sardik tolls out this this warning of, of, of grave funeral aspect and causes the bell to ring upon high. And for a moment, everyone can hear this, this ringing of the bell. And suddenly just it bursts forth in this shower of necrotic energy that drips upon it like rain and causes it to melt in just a wash upon the floor. Beautiful. And it makes a horrific <laughs> sound as it dies. <laughs> it's like the kind of sound that you'll hear again in your nightmares. I don't doubt it for Roscoe. <laughs> okay, well that's the surprise round. See? It's not always just you the uh, monster surprising you. <laughs> you get to surprise things sometimes. Uh, so now we start normal initiative. So it's Roscoe's turn again. Um, Roscoe will step kind of around this pillar, trying to be as quiet as possible, and use a bonus action to hide. Um, so we'll see how this goes. And if hidden from this carrion crawler, um, the attack oh. should get advantage. Hidden if from you the will one to the south. That. Yes, that is the plan. 
you're hidden, but if you step out to attack, you won't be hidden anymore. Unless you're making a ranged attack from there. Um, I guess I'm not. So... I mean... Yeah, I... If, if you um, would rule it that way, I, you don't have to give me the bonus action back. I, I will eventually step here and try and attack, is the plan. Um, so I can do that with or without the benefits of stealth. Uh, basically, the idea was to get behind here to initiate the stealth and then step out and attack. To get behind where? Um, actually, technically, because it's not really fully in the things, isn't it kind of in the square next to me right here? Oh, well, either way, I will, having yeah, done that... you know step... what, you're right. You could probably attack around that pillar from the north, the northern square. You could probably attack from... Or, or move into a position where you're still covered by enough of the pillar that you could stab them and get advantage. That's fine. It can still take some... It can take some cover AC benefit if you would like it to be that way. And, yeah, well, let's see how this goes. So the 14. <laughs> not 14 my hits. best rolls. It hits. Wow, not my best rolls. Thanks. Right, Roscoe is having an off, off night for Roscoe. Ouch. Um, so yeah, he like sneaks around this pillar and like thinking he's being all sly and like he like stumbles a little bit and like slices off one of these little like appendage things that it has. Realizes that it's not as effective as he wanted it to be. He's like, uh, uh, come in right back, guys. Um, and he's going to take the rest of his movement to um, get back to the rest of the group. You did draw some foul-looking green blood from the creature, though. So this is the best he can get with what movement he has left. Okay. Um, Midge's turn. Okay. Um, I know she has, so she has Shillelagh on her quarter staff, but she is going to cast Moonbeam instead of using just brute strength. Um, so she's going to cast it essentially centered on this one. On which one? The one down there. How big of an area is that? It is a five foot radius. Oh, I see. It's very small. So it's basically the same size as the creature, essentially. Yes, yes. And if it starts its turn uh, in it, it needs to make something. Some kind of save. Some some kind of save. A con So does it save right now? Um that is the end of Midge's turn, so yes, it would if it's the start of their turn, it would need to make that con save. Uh DC is fifteen. So on a fail or er, on a success, it takes half of that. It exactly made a 15. So it takes half of nine? Mm hmm. So this radiant moonlight that you call down from the stone ceiling above does sort of does sort of sizzle a bit of its flesh, but it doesn't look particularly phased. Yet. And you're concentrating on Moonbeam now. Yes. Okay, do you do anything else? No. Alright, it's the Carrion Crawlers go. Well, at least you killed one of them before he even got a turn. That's good. 
All right, so this one that's in the moonbeam starts his turn, so he needs to save again and fails this time. So roll another damage for the moonbeam. Wait, if it's the same one, I think uh, in you would only you only needed to do that once. Because it's specifically when a creature enters the spell area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there. So since it was starting its turn there, that's what the first con say. Uh, okay. Okay. In that case. Oh, you can move the moonbeam too. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... It's in this beam of disgusting, well, disgusting to it. It's actually quite beautiful moonlight. But the carrion crawler is pretty unhappy about it because it's burning it. So it's going to squeeze through between these pillars with its wormy body. That'll take double movement for it, but it's not moving very far. Squeezes through between those two pillars, wriggling its, its long, nasty body wriggling disgustingly as it, as it squeezes through. And then its tentacles lash out toward Roscoe. Ooh, 26 to hit. Oh. Uh, yeah, just fair. <laughs> Alright, you need to make... Well, first of all, you take four points of poison damage as you feel this sickening substance enter your bloodstream. So four points of poison damage, and you need to make a constitution saving throw DC 13. Uh -huh. Alright, you made it. And then... It bites you with its with its filthy mandibles, dripping still with bugbear innards. And that is a 16 to hit. That will hit as well. So you take five points of piercing damage from that. Alright. This one over here has also been lightning bolted and is not thrilled about it. It's going to come over. What's the speed? Okay. Crawls over the top of the body of its... Sort of moves into this space and stops there. Although, since it's not doing anything else, I guess it can dash and move further. So it costs double movement to squeeze through here. So that's another 30 feet. That takes 10 feet. Takes 20 feet. Alright, so it squeezes into this space, but that's all it can do. It can't attack this round. This one up here to the north that you noticed hasn't really been hit by anything. It's just gonna keep eating for now. So, Survival instincts are strong. Yeah. Hey, Sido, how's it going? Good to see you. Welcome. We've been 
Excited we've been having some trouble with Roll20, so if you could just reinstall your Discord real quick, that'd be great. Um, no, that's just a... that's an inside joke, but... Um, Katrin's turn. Alright, well... Target-rich environment up ahead here. She's gonna come up, draw out another dagger as her free interaction for the round. Move up into this gap next to Roscoe. And she... She says, are you alright? To Roscoe. Is he... Yeah, they had a rough... What? They had some nasty uh, poison or something. Overall. Don't put your nasty tentacles on my friend! And so she... Ah! Yells her strange little... <laughs> little... Um... You know, raging roar, and she is w going to attack the one that is immediately to the west of Roscoe. Actually, which one attacked you? It was the one to the to the southwest the of you south, that attacked you. So she's going to yeah. attack that one. With sneak attack, though, because you're adjacent to it. Actually, can she get into any kind of flanking position? Let's see. She could come down this way. kind of just wedge yourself in there and I would say that isn't really flanking though. <laughs> I think technically she'd need to be in one of these three squares. Alright, so she started here next to Sardic. Yeah, she's got enough movement. Even if she has to squeeze past this one pillar. She can get her all the way to the other side. So now the two of you are flanking that one. Oh no. Oh, but she has the advantage, advantage from, from flanking. flanking. Yeah. Nice. A clutch flank. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, cool. In that case, she does stab him. To the tune of seven damage. Wow. The rogues aren't rolling so well tonight. Alright, that's it for Katrin's turn. Sardic? Sardic will go, uh, Sardic will go ahead and target the uh, one to the south that uh, they've both been beating up on and continue his litany of Bound by the Wyvern Jack, the Rammer of Pillars! I sound this note upon his name. Not that one. Spare the dying. That huh? one. Bold choice. <laughs> that would be a bizarre choice. Uh, you could be casting it on the downed Aquarian crawler. <laughs> um, Toll the Dead again. I like it. Let's get a wisdom. Which one is it that you're targeting? Uh, the one to the south. Okay. It does make it save. So I guess it takes none, right? It takes not a thing. Anything else? You gonna move? Or do any bonus action? Yes. Sardic will go ahead and bring himself up um, up to face these two things, and um, that's about it. Ara's turn. Ara is going to stay right where she is, and she is going to cast Scorching Ray at a higher level, and so that's two for each of them. By the way, I forgot something. You still have that moonbeam sitting down there. I have it where that carrion crawler had been previously. That means Katrin ran into the moonbeam. 
It seems like something yeah. she would Would she have willingly do that? Because yeah, it was, like, right there. She thought it's moonlight. No problem. Plus, she's in a rage. She's not really thinking clearly. It, she doesn't care. So she is going to take damage. Or right, at least she, she has make to the... make a save. No, she would make the con save, yeah. Well, she's good at con saves. Real good. Okay. Yeah. So does that mean she takes half? Uh, yeah. All right, so roll that damage for her. She's also going to take half damage because she's raging and she's a totem barbarian. So she's really going to take a quarter damage. Ooh, that's a big roll, though. <laughs> so she only she only takes four. All right. Now, Ara, you're shooting off some scorching rays. Yes. So How many scorching one. rays? Four rays? Uh, it's going to be four of them because I'm doing it at a higher level. And... So the first two for the uh, southern one. Uh, I believe both of those hit. Hello? Oh, the first oh. two for the southern one you said? And those yep, do both for hit, this yes. one right here. Okay, so that's for that one. And then last one I assume hits, so top one, the ten. Alright, so we've got a total of eight fire damage for the one on the south. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. There's a crackling, searing sound as smoke rises up from it. And I'm it, just again, I'm trying to cook them. Makes a horrifying sound. <laughs> and the one on top takes ten. Yes. Alright. Well, the air is now full of the sickening smell of burning carrion crawler. No, it does Delicious. not smell good, Saito. It's it's pretty nasty. <laughs> and that is my turn. Brings us back to Roscoe. All right. Uh, I'm gonna start by hitting the one to the south a bit, With and because flanking. of flanking, yeah. I'll take the twenty-two, please. Oh my goodness. My sneak attacks. All right, um, so that will be 13 damage to this one. All right, now you feel a nice satisfying sensation as your rapier pierces the tough skin and sinks in with a with a sort of a pop sound, like uh, like if you stab into a I don't know a big centipede like a, thing <laughs> like a like a tough like a real tough sausage or something and the, the juices run out of course in this case is the juices are sort of greenish not enough to kill it it sounds like not enough to kill it but it does look pretty badly injured now from all these different attacks okay roscoe is going to um turn to the side um whip out a dagger from his belt um, and make an attack with his offhand at this one. At the same um, one? No, at the top one. Um, sorry, at this guy. So For some that reason, he... I don't see... Are you, are you guys pinging the map? Because I'm not seeing oh. any map pings. I used I an arrow. He's, yeah, he's oh, using the arrows. Perfect, that's um, fine. Yeah. And then that will be a measly... That does not get sneak attack. Um, the four piercing. And with that, Roscoe will step back. So whipped out oh, dagger, I like see. I know why you, you attack them both so that you can get away with your swashbuckler thing, right? It's basically a more useful disengage when there's only two um, two enemies here. Cool. And I'll so step back to right here. Okay. Perfect. And that's it. Midge. I'm gonna move my moonbeam to this creature, essentially taking up its space. Oh. 
Ugh. Alright, so you move the moonbeam up to the northern creature's space, and when it starts its turn, it will make the save. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna move up a little bit just to get a better view of what's going on. Okay. But that's it. Carrion Crawlers. So the Carrion Crawler starts its turn and needs to save against the Moonbeam. Does not save. So it takes the full nine. So now it's been burned by fire and it's been burned by radiant light. And lightning. Is that one that... Oh yeah, that one was hit by lightning too, huh? No, <laughs> that thing is not happy. <laughs> that thing is seared and blackened, but still it continues to move and thrash about. Um, and it's going to attack Sardik, since that's who's kind of right in front of it now. So it lashes out with its long tentacles. 25 to hit. Yeah. Three poison damage. Remember that you take half damage from poison because you're a dwarf. So it's really one poison damage for you. Very true. And make a constitution saving throw. This is a poison effect, though. So do you get advantage on these? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Advantage on saving throws versus poison. Yep. So go ahead and make it with advantage. No problem. You you fight off the poison and it barely tickles you. You've, you've literally had drinks stronger than this. <laughs> that turn into meat's worse than that. Now. Worse. <laughs> and it bites you with an attack of 22, dealing 8 piercing damage. Okay. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the one to the south is going to turn around and attack the one who is on its back and attack Katrin. Tentacles does not hit her. And Bite does hit her with a 22. Deals six damage, six piercing, but she takes half damage from everything right now, almost everything. So she only takes three. She kind of yells out, Hey! Don't bite me! We'll see which one of us is the last one standing. Spoiler alert! It's not going to be you! <laughs> Katrin is kind of OP. Well, I wanted to make her really tanky so that just the party would have like an extra person who could soak up a lot of hits. So I made her about as tanky as I could. And the reason she's, well, the reason she has rogue levels is really because of her story. But the other thing is at fifth level rogue, she'll also get uncanny dodge. So then she'll be able I to love take uncanny one, dodge. one quarter damage, half from being raging and half from uncanny dodge. So that would be pretty awesome, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Roscoe is sitting one level away from having that, and there were, I'm sure gonna be times I wish I had that. It's an amazing ability. Uh okay. There's one carrying crawler left. It doesn't really well now that Katrin's kinda out in the air here in front of it, it might try to get over there and get after her. Five and fifteen. So it squeezes past some pillars slowly, and it, it can only get that far, not in range to attack anyone. In which case, it 
might as well dash, I guess. Uh. So <clears throat> it's gonna move on top of the dead one, right on top of the dead one's corpse. And that will do it for the carrying crawler's turn. Making it Katrin's turn. So now she's got another one creeping up on her. But she's going to keep working on this one in the middle that uh, she's flanking with Sardik. Hits with advantage for seven. Still not enough to kill it. Opening another bloody gash on its back. Sardik's turn. All these things do is... All they understand is the language of the blade. And well, this one isn't an elvish! Barzul! <laughs> <laughs> this one isn't an elvish. Uh, well, you hit, certainly. Thwamped for ten. Is that the one that's, uh... Between Blanking. you and Katrin? Yes. All right. You have just killed your second carrion crawler. You want to narrate it? So, after speaking of this not being an elvish, he's just going to take it, swing it across, and just smack it on the chin, and the head its just going to cleave the jaw, break it right off, and send it shooting into the wall. And the rest of it just falls in a slump. Beautiful. Peace be with you, beast. Peace be with you. All right. You do anything else on your turn? No, he's going to stay right there. All right. All right, again. All right. Uh, Ara's going to kind of go for what seems to be working for her. This time she's just going to go with just the normal level Scorching Ray. And two are going to go for the one that's already... Uh, one's going to go for the one that's already been hit, and then the new one that just came is two. So the first two will go for the back one. And the other one. And that one. I think I actually zapped Midge. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, about paranoia. <laughs> I know. Sorry! I was expecting that. All right, so... <laughs> Those two, even with giving the Carrion Crawler some cover from the pillar, those still hit. It's going to take the full 12 damage of fire. And it remains standing. I kind of figured that, but... But hey. that is the one that's been burned by fire twice, by lightning once, and by radiant. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, the, the one that... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the one that I already hit, I did too. So that one and got is... a whisker sliced off with the dagger. Let's not forget that poor damage. It's almost completely black. <laughs> it looks like a, a, a some kind of ash beast at this point. <laughs> and the other. Why one... won't you die? <laughs> Man, you're shooting in there past these pillars. You rolled a one. Uh... It's not a good roll. All right. Midge, make a dexterity save. Oh, I'm so sorry, Midge. It's not a hard one, though. DC 10. A dex save? Yeah. All right. You, oh. you narrowly avoid being hit by a stray scorching ray. You call it stray. I call it intentional. I look at her yeah, and I'm like, with sorry. The paranoia, with the paranoia, it definitely seems I know. like she did it on purpose. <laughs> Treacherous drow. <laughs> I, I'm giving her this, like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, and she's seeing, ha ha ha, too bad it missed you. 
When better to <laughs> turn on your allies aside from in a fight like this? I know. How do we know I'm not actually doing that? Of course you make it seem like an accident. No one was there when I spoke to the drow a second time, were you? I wish I had been there though. <laughs> Roscoe? Um, question. Do you allow people to move through dead bodies freely or is that um, still blocked off as if they were? I count it as difficult terrain unless you have some sort of ability that it make it would where it wouldn't be difficult terrain for you. Like with not with uh, Sardix boots, I would say they don't count as difficult terrain for him. All right, that means I will move to. Oh, my movement's been weird. Unless you want to try some athletic, some acrobatics nonsense to sort of like vault uh... over it or something. I'll I'll go with the more by the books approach. Let's let's get this one out before it has a chance to attack. Um, so I'll get into flanking with this one um, around the pillars. Yeah, you hit it. Okay. And <laughs> you have gotten yourself a kill. What's All right. So Roscoe like? will kind of like sneak around here, um, and as like Sardic just. Um, just killed the other one and these like fiery bolts streak up to this one roscoe is kind of like slyly sneaking around the side and as it like rears back from the impacts of the firebolt he like runs and like does like a sort of like running jump climbing up the back of it, it like gets to the back of his neck grabs onto some of these whisker things with one hand and with the other hand just like plunges the rapier straight down um, and it kind of like slides off from its death throes um, nice it's very dramatic looking and with Cat that, Catherine he's going says, to... Woohoo! That was cool! <laughs> because he can um, take the dagger that I guess was in his offhand, so I guess he couldn't really have grabbed one of the whiskers, but with that, um, he's going to um, turn and throw it at this carrion crawler down by Katrin with the offhand. All right. And no sneak attack, but... Um... You did hit it, though. And got one piercing. <laughs> um, now you roll a good better sneak than, attack when it doesn't than, count. His sneak attacks have been good every time it hasn't counted. I know, right? <laughs> All right, you slightly nick this carrying crawler. It doesn't even notice. Throw it better than nothing. So that's your turn. Yep. Midge. I'm going to move Moonbeam to that carrion crawler, and I'm just going to move that pillar's in my way. You can squeeze through spaces between the pillars if you t pay double movement for it. Like if there's that space between the pillar and the wall, basically it just costs you twice mm -hmm. as much movement to get through there. All right. Well, I just needed, I just wanted to move over a little bit. Oh, good moonbeam roll. Is that it? Yep, that's gonna be it. Green crawler, it needs to make a con save because it's in a moonbeam. Take some moon damage. It does not make the save, so it takes the full 16. More sizzling, searing, carrion crawler flesh sounds and smells. It really smells terrible in here now. Well, it's not happy with all the things that are happening to it in its life right now. <laughs> it doesn't really have any concept of where this moon fire is coming from. So... It's just going to attack Katrin again, because it doesn't really know what else to do. These things aren't exactly tacticians. So the tentacles... ...do not hit. The bite, again, another 22. What the shit? I raised her AC to 21, I'm like, nothing's going to hit her now. Then everybody rolls yeah. a 22. <laughs> like, just one number above, just to, just to, you know, salt the wound. All right, so 
he does manage to sink his mandibles into Katrin's shoulder, and she cries out in pain, but not very much pain because she takes half of that, so she only takes four damage. And then it's gonna just stay where it is. Wait, it's in the moonbeam. Maybe it won't stay where it is. I think it wants to get out of the moonbeam, actually. So it will move. And when it does so, it will provoke an opportunity attack. It's going to move toward Roscoe. And Cat gets an opportunity attack. And she can get sneak attack, actually, on this, because it's... Not her turn right now. Yeah, but what would she get? Why would she get sneak attack? Oh, never mind. Right. Sorry, sorry. Might be. Yeah, well, she hits. Oh, it's a seven without sneak attack. That's good. I forgot we weren't flanking this thing. <laughs> so she managed to open up a nice wound on it as it gets out of the moonbeam. So that's basically extra damage that you did with your Moonbeam, if you think about it, because your Moonbeam forced it to move. Sardik's turn. Sardik will look down on this. And... Your friends have fallen. You were the last. Go and join them now. I like how he's taunting these creatures with words that they clearly cannot understand. It's sort of like everyone taunting him with, like, letters and paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, another Toll the Dead, huh? Yep. Alright, let's make that save. Does not save. So, 12 damage either way, huh? Yes. All right, now its flesh is being eaten away by necrotic energy. It's wriggling and writhing in pain. Too dumb to run, though. Somehow in, in this creature's tiny mind, it imagines it can still win. Anything else, Sardik? Uh, he'll go ahead and wiggle waggle between the corpses and right to the... Intelligence of one, Saito. Alright. Back to Ara. Alright, she's gonna move This to one the... looks pretty badly hurt. Nice. Um... Come on, stop freezing. There we go. Um, she is going to, she's going to try something a little different, and she's going to cast that and miss. <laughs> Luckily not crit. That is a miss. Yeah. And that is her turn. Okay. Roscoe. All right. Roscoe will step to the side so that he is flanking with Sardic here. And then make a rapier attack. Aha! There are some damage numbers. That is enough to get your second kill. You have a little story for us? Sure. As Roscoe is like moving around, this one like saw what he did to the other one and is like tracking with it, and it's like basically about to lunge down on him to bite him, and Roscoe is like jabbing up at the same time and it kind of like skewers straight through the mouth um, of this one and falls limp and kind of like right onto Roscoe um, as it is nice. that. And you've killed all the carrying crawlers. You made short work of those things. Good job. None of you even really got particularly hurt. I guess Roscoe took some damage, but... Yeah, I mean, not too much overall. He just doesn't have a huge amount of health. Um, but he'll look over to Midge and be like, I I'm not feeling super great right now. Is this when I take the, eat the berry you gave me? Uh, it's better for when you're, 
like on death's door. Oh, so you don't think I should eat this right now? Okay. I can I can hold on to it. I mean, are you on death's door? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, like I just took a bath and now there's all this scoop on me again. But that's not going to kill me, I don't. Sartical listened to all this and shrug and go, well, I was just hungry and ate mine. Katrin is still in a rage and she wants to make sure these things don't get back up. So she's going from body to body, jumping on them and just stabbing them over and over in the head, each one, just to make sure. As she works out the rest of her, her frenzy. This would be a great time to take a little break, I think, since we uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're we've been going for a little while. Does anybody want to take a like a two to five minute break? Sounds good to me. Mine might be seven. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Sure. It was a two minute break and a five minute break, so in a way they were both two to five minute breaks. Yeah, it's good a two point. and. Anyway, I'll be back in just a couple minutes. Stick around, stay Same. tuned, don't touch that dial. I will BRB. Hashtag super fast. Little do they know, there's another surprise in store for them. I'm back. I'm back. Everybody else is gone. Mm -hmm. I love the narrations and the little, like, prayers and stuff you do in combat I gave you 
inspiration for that. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I, I feel like with the clerics, all the cleric spells being verbal, I have, you know, I can put some sort of an element in with that that kind of works to that advantage. I keep underestimating how tough this group is. I thought four carrion crawlers would be a fairly difficult fight, but it wasn't difficult for you guys at all. I think surprise rounds just make that a bit different, right? Yeah, because we true. had one of them down instantly, and one of them wasn't in a position to attack us the first round, and the other one actually didn't even come to us the first round. That's so true. we had a little bit of a funnel on. Them. Yeah, if it was a different situation, if they all just dropped onto you from the ceiling and surprised you in an open area, I guess it would have been more heinous. But I'm glad, actually. I don't want to make encounters that are too hard, but uh, it's good to know that I can keep bumping up the difficulty a little bit without having to worry about, you know, destroying you guys. Yeah, and I think all of us generally know what our character is do and what they're good at, so I think that helps to have a group like that. True, and I didn't even invoke a bless or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, Midge used one spell. You didn't Ara use used any a spells. Bit of heavy. Ara, though, she used two thirds and a second. So that, yeah. that that's a significant investment for her. But we'll have other people to pick up slack in other fights with the heavy spells, so it just means oh, um, that... Um, Katrin used one of her rages. That's true as well. She gets those back on a short rest or a long rest? Long rest. She just gets three mm. per day. Well, I do think we should make more use of short rest than we did last time down here, but I think the reason that we didn't is because we then had a baby to take back up, so it just made sense to go back up and look. Oh yeah, I think you guys should definitely be short resting and not, you know, not constantly going back up. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but it's not my my expectation that you're going to be constantly going back up. Yeah, and I think once we get deeper in, it will make more sense to camp out somewhere inside the dungeon. We were just so made sense to go back. How many bodies are going to pile up in this one room? <laughs> and every time you come back here, there's something else to fight. Everything that wants to eat the carrion crawlers now, like, but these are going to be big things if they're eating carrion crawlers. Yeah. Or like, a whole um, lot of, a whole lot of tiny things. Like an Odiog is here now, like, this is the new trash pile. Or whatever yeah. those things are called. I've made every encounter that's in the book harder, and you guys have tromped all over them with no problem. Like, this is only supposed to be three carrying crawlers, and I made it four, and it was no problem for you guys. I will say, though, and again, it kind of was three carrying crawlers because of that surprise round, but I don't think we would have had too much more difficulty if there was an extra. Well, nobody got poisoned. That's what makes carrying crawlers dangerous, is their poison with the paralysis, you know, and nobody got paralyzed, so that kind of takes a lot of the sting out of carrying crawlers. Yeah, I've never actually used one, so I don't know all of its details, but if it paralyzes you and there's multiple, then that actually stacks up in lethality pretty quick. Exactly, that's why I was concerned this might be, this might, you know, go an ugly direction, but it didn't, which is good. I like to give you guys a chance to surprise something every once in a while. <laughs> <clears throat> Anybody hungry? These are cooked. <laughs> yeah, they, they are well cooked. Is everybody back or are we still waiting on something? Yeah. Sardic, you did technically find these. <laughs> Can we eat that? Nice. Like, we're at the top of the food chain now, right? <laughs> you could probably eat them. Ooh, they do have they poison tasty. glands if we want to try and uh, 
take I was poison. thinking about that. I don't know why I'm speaking in Roscoe's voice, but... Depends if Mitch was speaking in hers, I guess. <laughs> so if everybody's back, I have a thing to tell you. Alright, I don't know who can see down this hallway right now. Which hallway? The long hallway to the left. But uh, Ara can. Anybody that can see down there notices a bugbear slip out of one of the alcoves in that hallway uh, and start sprinting and start sprinting to the to the to the west essentially the bugbear gets a surprise round since you didn't know he was there and he spends his surprise round dashing away i don't know did anybody see him can anybody uh, see him all right can all right, then mm. you can decide whether you, what you tell your friends. Um, he's running away, so Ara's not gonna say anything because she feels like if we say something, we're gonna end up going into battle, and her first priority is to go see the vampires because if we move from the section, we are in danger as far as she understands. So she doesn't say anything. All right. Um, so at this point, so you don't say anything. Nobody else saw the bugbear. No. Nope. Okay. At this point, you're starting to see some strange movement in that hallway. As, that yeah, as shadows, shadowy energy in the air is drifting out of those alcoves. Not every alcove, but many of them. And starting to coalesce into the shape of humanoid figures. Alright, I guess I'm saying something, guys. <laughs> um, and I kind of point down the hall where uh, I saw the bugbear where I originally did the, the uh, fireball for the last one, and I'm like, there's something over there. Roscoe's gonna start moving back in to get a view on it. Alright, you know, we can actually stay in the same initiative order, unless you guys want to re-roll initiative. But if you, mm. everyone has to re-roll initiative if you're gonna re-roll it. I'm cool with saying if everybody wants to. Um, um, that's fine with me, but are we back. are we in initiative right now, like in order to move, or we can move freely? I'll give you guys all one movement right now, for free. Like Katrin was kind of up on a carrion crawler, stabbing it. Okay, because Midge would have moved down to get a better look at what Aro was pointing at. Okay. Which I think I can see. We're just like standing on these carrion crawlers. <laughs> They're a bit in the way, aren't they? Yeah, Roscoe can see one of them now, so. So you don't want to reroll initiative? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, Roscoe and Midge have really good initiative, and, and I think. Unless Sardic wanted to, but I'm not really caring. I'm fine to let it stand if we're doing it. High initiative doesn't necessarily benefit Roscoe. I honestly, I'm fine with it standing as well, though. But okay, I need to roll some initiatives here. Also, while you do that, is it possible to make a check to identify what these things are? Yeah, I mean, technically they're not really formed yet. You haven't you can't really see see them. They're just sort of forming, so not yet. All right, I'll wait. Carrion 
Dream Crawler can be closed. Shadowy Duplicate can be opened. I decided to do individual initiatives for each of these, so this, the initiative part will take a little longer. That's fair. If they all had to go at the same time, that would be a pretty rough <laughs> uh, enemy phase for us. Mm. So you see that some sort of humanoid shadowy figures are starting to coalesce into existence in the in the tunnel if you can kind of see in there and kind of see into the, any of the I have vision on one of them. I can see three of them. All right, so Roscoe, you can go ahead and act now. Can I so, try and make a check to see none what of the it creatures, is? None of the creatures will actually exist, per se, until their initiative order comes up. Alright, I'm going to delay until one of them has a turn. Like, until after one of them has taken a turn and I can figure out what's going on. Alright, well, one of them is now going to take a turn. It fully coalesces and it looks like a bugbear, except it's made completely out of shadow. So it is going to drift through the air silently in your direction. flying. So it will drift up to Roscoe. You can make a check now if you want. It would be an Arcana check. 21. Okay, you think there is definitely an illusionary sort of nature to these things. Like, they, they seem to be made of of shadow magic, which is related to illusion magic. As opposed to being, like, some kind of actual undead. Okay, but this seems physical enough to hurt me, or does it actually just seem like an illusion? Well, you know that shadow magic, shadow illusions are... With that roll, you know this pretty like, well enough. Plus, you do know some magic a little bit now. But um, is like a type of illusion that's semi-real, so it can actually affect the physical world, even though it's technically a type of illusion. Okay. And in fact, it's going to try to affect you right now. All right. As it, as it reaches out one of its shadowy hands to try to brush against your skin. 17 Will to hit. hit. Alright. 
So, you feel this horrible draining feeling as you feel your life force kind of being sucked out of you by this touch. You take 10 points of necrotic damage. And... Oh, shit. Your strength is reduced by two. Oh. Oh. Okay. So it sucks away some of your strength. And if, you know, I don't know if that will make you encumbered now or not, but you can figure that out. Uh, Anyway, it it is your turn now since you delayed to right after it went. So you can take your turn at this moment if you want. And I don't have any concept of how many there are, right? I you only, only know saw how many you can one. see. But Ara did say there were multiple, because she said there were more than one. Yeah, uh, Ara, Ara would have said I can see at least three from where I'm standing. All right, and shadow magic like this is not undead, right? I, like, I, I don't think it is, but I'm just double checking. Yeah, you do not think these are undead. Alright, I will convey what I know about these, um, and with a silvered rapier... Do I know anything about, like, what, like whether normal weapons affect these things, or whether... You suspect that normal weapons probably aren't going to do very well against these things. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna cast Booming Blade on it. Um, I won't have advantage, um, but basically, as it as it reaches out and touches me, there's gonna be like this kind of spark of anger in Roscoe's eyes, and this sort of like greenish flare is gonna kind of return and like start crackling up um, around him and around his rapier, and he's going to make an attack, which I think a 21 will hit. It does hit. Okay. So, um, the seven is thunder damage. So seven thunder, ten plus nine. So seven thunder and nineteen piercing um, on that strike. Oh, because you do get sneak attack. Okay, so seven thunder and nineteen piercing. Yes. All right. None of that, including the thunder damage seems to do as much damage to this thing as you would have expected it to. It seems resistant. So it takes half from all of it, including the thunder. So 20... Okay. So it takes 13, right? Um, yes, 13. All right. It looks like it's almost completely dispersed, but it's still clinging together just enough to continue to attack. You do anything else? Yeah, he's going to back upwards up the hallway. I need to figure out what my speed is while encumbered, though. Um, can I just say that I'm going straight up as far as I can and calling retreat, and I'll let you know how far that is in a second? Yeah, you can. Are you taking a bonus action? Yes, bonus action dash with that too okay and i'm saying we need to, we need to get out of here so it's midge's turn okay. so my speed dropped by 10 so i can get 40 feet up here i might not take the whole 40 feet i'm just going to get to a safe distance up here and what does midge do uh midge watches as roscoe runs away <laughs> That thing had, and there were a bunch of them. <laughs> Bravely well, I only, away. I only see this one. Bonus action, shillelagh. I'm gonna, tr- I guess, use my action to hit it. Oh, I'm gonna miss. Yeah, that's not gonna hit. So um, your staff swings through empty space. You would have hit it, but a lot of its form has already been disrupted by Roscoe's attack, and so you you're, you pass right through one of the areas that Roscoe already sort of destroyed. Alright, well... Mm, 
Mitch you know, believe well I would say she knows that there's more of them, but your I can't. Your moonbeam is still up. There's it, it hasn't oh, it been long enough. Be your moonbeam could still exist, yes, if you if you want it to. I would love for it to still exist. Mm-hmm. Um can I retcon what just happened then, or should we just say it exists and I can do something with it next? We can retcon because you didn't know that, and so if you want to use your action to move the beam instead, I'm okay with that. You're too kind. Um, I would move, yeah, so Midge will stay where she is, she'll move Moonbeam to it instead. Alright. That's a good roll. But it doesn't take that until the start of its next turn. Right. Um, I guess since it's a five foot radius, it'll be in these four squares. Oh, you made a circle. Good. Yeah, I should be able to move that one too. Um, but yeah, if that's there, in that case, I'm going to actually move up. You can't move it? No, I can move. Yeah, the circle I can move. Okay, good. Oh. Anything it's else? There? No, I don't. I'm just moving myself up. Sorry, I couldn't see the circle for a moment. So if oh, you move over dead bodies, it's difficult terrain. Going um, upstairs is difficult terrain, too. Yeah, no, she's not hitting up the stairs. Um, but from where she was, yeah, she'd have enough movement to at least get... That would probably alter how far Roscoe got, actually. Yeah, I'm recalculating it now. Unless you had enough extra movement that it wouldn't matter. Okay, mid uh, I can't get to hear them. Very distantly, very muffled, from from the west, you hear what sounds like, and it's so and it's so quiet that you can't make out any individual words, even if you speak goblin. But you hear something yelling in goblin, but it's it sounds like it's coming from very far away. So, okay, some of these guys are going to go now. So this one will go ahead and dash. And bring itself and bring itself over here next to Catherine, but it can't attack right now. All right, Katrin's turn. She's still in her rage. For like five more rounds, I think. How many rounds did the fight with the carrion crawlers actually take? 
Um, I think it took four. I went back up and counted how many times I rolled for Moonbeam. And then you guys took like a round or two in between, basically. Um, so she's got like four more rounds of rage, let's say. So she's looking to Roscoe and Midge. She's, you're kind of withdrawing up that way, but she's in a rage. <laughs> She's not going to retreat. She's going to go on the attack and try to slash this thing. She does hit. But she doesn't get sneak attack. And she's only doing half damage because it only takes half damage. So she does three damage to it. What are these things? Why are they so hard to kill? Uh, they're similar to illusions. Um, uh, I think they, we should probably be careful. Then you know what she's going to do? She's going to use cunning action to take a bonus action to disengage and move. Up to here in the hopes of being able to lock down more of these things if they come out. All right, they get some more turns. This one comes out and it'll go right for Katrin. but it does not hit her. She holds up her magical shield and it that stops the creature's semi-incorporeal hand. And then this one. And it's Aura's turn. Um, or I can see this one behind Katrin. So she is going to one, two, three. On the one directly to the west of Katrin? Yes. All right, that's force damage. Magic missile. Doesn't seem to resist that. 14 points. Yes, sir. You seem to almost completely blow it away, but it's still barely clinging to existence. All right, and then I believe if we do the difficult terrain 20 feet, I would be able to move here. Yep, and that Are is you... my turn. Okay. Uh, oops, I just accidentally skipped a bunch of people. <laughs> Alright, well, it's Sardik's turn. And then it's duplicate number six. Does Sardik get the feeling that his usual funeral tactics wouldn't have any effect on these things? Considering they are shadow. Well, make a... Arcana or religion check. <laughs> you have no idea. Mm, Sartical frown as he's watching Katrin beginning to get overrun by these monstrosities and a, a verse of wondering a versing of told the dead begins to form on his lips but he shakes his head ducks around these pillars to the other side comes back around over here and 
with a dwarven battle yell, he's just going to go and slice at the thing with his warhammer. Okay. There's no pillars in between you and it, right? Right, he just kind of went that way and then up, and he's flanking with Katrin. Oh, good. Well, you certainly hit it. For a whopping four. And your weapon isn't magical, right? It doesn't count as magical nope. for any reason? Not okay. at all. In that case, you do two damage, as it seems to resist that. Is that your turn? Sardic will... <clears throat> he will call upon... Wyvern Jack, we are within your forest. Come, come aid me now. Smite these things that would try to... to just overrun us. Run them over like you would so many pillars. And he will use his bonus action to invoke a spiritual weapon. It's only a bonus action, huh? That's amazing. Yep. It's a good spell. All right, it's I have a thing for your spiritual attack. weapon here. I just placed it down there in the hall. I think you can move that, Nox. I don't think I see it. In the in the hallway behind you guys. The horns? Right here. Ah, uh, okay. It was behind a pillar for me. Okay, yeah, he'll put the horns right there, right on the steps. And he's going to go after the one that's between that and Katrin, so effectively to the left of Kat. Okay, uh, go ahead and make its attack. Oh, you already did. Yes. Well, spiritual weapons do not get flanking. And even if it did, you wouldn't have hit. But the horns are now in play. And you have to concentrate on that, right? Nope. Spiritual weapons, not concentration. Damn, that's a good spell. Yep, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> and it does force damage, which will affect these things fully. Good job. Okay. Uh, then number six went. Number three. How smart are these? Not super. It's gonna come up and try to attack the horns. And <laughs> that won't do anything, because the horns can't be damaged in any way, right? It doesn't say they can be, so... It just wastes its turn trying to attack the spiritual weapon. Alright, number two... The one that's north of Katrin will go ahead and make a save. Make a save because it's in the moonbeam. Thank you. <laughs> Yo. It fails. How much damage did you roll with that? Uh, 18 radiant. All right, it takes 36 from that. Holy moly. Ooh. And is instantly vaporized out of existence. Ooh. Oh, I think we found something that worked. I think I know what to do now, guys. I don't exactly do radiant damage, though. <laughs> So Roscoe's going to. Or it's Roscoe's turn now, right? With that one dead. 
Um, yep, it's Roscoe's turn. Roscoe is going to drop his backpack so that he is no longer encumbered, um, and he's going to step up. All right, so this is going to be a bonus action dash to get up to where he is. Um, he is going to make an attack with flanking against the one south of him. Does a 17 hit? Yes, it does. And this is no booming blade. All right, so that will be 13 reduced to six damage on that one. All right. It seems like it should have been a fatal blow, but this thing just resists your weapon so much that... Oh, actually, that was difficult to train that Roscoe was walking through. So he's up to 10, so he doesn't have much movement speed, but he's going to back up the one that he has left with the difficult train. Okay. You're crawling over these crawlers. It's crawler section. <laughs> Avoiding ridges the beam. <laughs> All right, well, it's Midge's turn. All right, she's going to move. There we go. Can kind of see. Uh, action to move the moonbeam over this way. I don't think I can get... Yeah, I think I can only really target that one guy. If you move it down another square, you can block off that whole passage from them, though. Yeah, it probably would have helped if I made this, like, to no, scale. That's, that's so perfect. this would be able to take up, yeah, those four squares, essentially. Uh, is movement, that is my action. Midge kind of looks over at Roscoe and says, uh, Oh, you came back. Uh, Y'all didn't want to leave. <laughs> there. Oh. That was more reassuring than I thought it was, the way you said it. No, it, well, it shouldn't have been. Thank you. That was her condescending healing. So you move the moonbeam and you cast a healing word on Roscoe? Yeah. Also, I'm going to put a little moon. marker for Roscoe's pack. So and I'll re-roll the moonbeam. Hmm. I like that other damage better. Me too. Well, they, still, they take double from Radiant. Yeah, so if it doubles, be a though. Lot of damage. Even if it saves. If it saves, it'll take <laughs> just the regular nine. Is Midge done? Yes. Midge can dimly hear, and I guess, well, no, it's a passive perception thing. Only Midge hears it. Midge can dimly, dimly hear some muffled sound of more shouting and goblin. Too far away to make out, though. Uh, what direction do I hear it from? From the west. <sighs> okay. I would, I would at least say, like, uh, incoming sounds like we have something down there and point toward the west. All right, uh, number five. Which one are you, number five? One of the ones over here. Number four is the one in between Sardik and Katrin. It will turn its attention to Sardik. Actually, no, because it's flanking Katrin. So with flanking, it'll go ahead and attack her.
unfortunately. Still misses. And then it's Katrin's turn. She's got a couple of them on her. Well, she's smart enough to realize that the Moonbeam will probably obliterate the one in front of her. So she'll turn her attention back to the one that she's flanking with Sardic and attack with advantage herself. Well, that should hit. She does 11, but it only takes half, so she does five. Oh, but that one was almost dead, and five is exactly enough to kill it. So she slashes across what would be the back of its neck, and its shadowy head kind of drifts apart from its shadowy body, and then the whole thing dissipates. Ha! Got one! So they can die! I can take these off the initiative track of the ones that are gone. Alright, two down. She doesn't have any reason to move anywhere, I guess, so... All right, number seven is back this way. Number one. That is the one in the moonbeam. Let's make that save. Makes the save with a natural 20, but it still takes half, right? Yep. So, 9 damage. She's AFK right now. Oh, she's AFK? Oh, back. Well, half of 9 is 4, but doubled. The half and the double cancel each other out, so it'll just take the full 9. Which is enough to destroy it, so another one is vaporized by the radiant light of the moonbeam. And that's three down. All right, number eight. Comes up. Ara's turn. Um, Ara can't see anything and everything else is dead. So she is going to ready uh, a spell for anything that comes down those stairs. What spell? Uh, she's going to do magic missile again. <laughs> it seemed to have done something. Okay. Putting that moonbeam right there to block off that whole hallway, by the way. <laughs> Genius. Brilliant, because they're all going to have to take the radiant damage to get, you know, it's perfect. So they're all going to get damaged, and then we're going to do the rest. Sardik's turn. Herd them, Wyvern Jack. Herd them into the light. And the bullhorns will nimbly just prance around to the other side of the creature and prod it with their horn. <laughs> that hits. Forced for four. Well, it doesn't resist it, but four is not that much. So you heard it, but not badly. And that's just a bonus action for you to do that, right? Yeah, that was just a bonus action. So what else you got? Would you like to lick the moonbeam? <laughs> I think I'll pass on that one, as tempting as that might be.
Sardik will go ahead and call out and say, your end is nigh. And he's going to invoke the sound in the creature's mind. All right. I'm not even going to make the save. The necrotic damage does absolutely nothing to it. I had a feeling. You going to move? Yeah, Sardical advance over and form a vanguard with Katrin. Sounds good. Number six. The last one over here. Okay. Number three. It's not going forward. And these things would be frightened by an area of radiant energy. It's not going to willingly enter it. So... Instead, it will make a futile attack against the horns. and then move into this alcove. All right, Roscoe. Um, with not much else better to do, he's going to step down for a clear, oh, his bow's back up in his backpack, I would guess. He's going to Ready an action. He's going to step up to here and ready an action for if one gets close to anyone. All right. To attack with his rapier. Yeah. You guys can see that Katrin, still raging, looks like she's getting ready to charge through the moon with me. I figured. If you'd like to attempt to talk her out of it, you can. Or just advance the moonbeam. Well, I think my turn comes before her, so I'm gonna... Oh, yeah. Just... Oh, and you can move it. I, I keep forgetting you can move it whenever you want. Yeah. Okay, so it's not gonna matter. Alright, it is your turn, Midge. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, that helps. There's an amazing place to move it. I don't know if you how well you can see down the hall from where you oh, are. Oh, I think I think I see it. <laughs> so I'll move my moonbeam right there. Beautiful. Moonbeam is literally the best possible spell against these creatures. Uh, In such a tight place too. Yeah. For this like specific location. Should I roll it again? Um, you can wait and roll it when the when, when their, their turn, turn comes, comes up, up and they're actually going to take the damage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The bugbear is doing his thing. All right. Duplicate number five. His turn. He's got to make his save. You can roll the damage now. He fails. <laughs> he takes thirty damage and is instantly destroyed. Katrin's turn. She's gonna go barreling forward, waving her arms in the air like she just don't care. Can a person occupy the same space as the spiritual weapon? Yes, I'm pretty certain of that. Yeah, like unless it says it, it occupies a space or that people can't. Yeah, okay, so she can move right into the horns. 
And as she does so, she sees this one hiding in the alcove right here. She attacks it. Recklessly, using strength instead of dexterity. Which hits. And she does 8 damage, but she gets plus 2 more because she's raging and she attacked with strength. So, 10 damage reduced in half to 5. She yells, Yeah! She's just yelling out these guttural cries that sound so strange coming out of this tiny little teenage girl. Okay, uh, number 7. Time for a moonbeam. Can roll damage again. Fails the save. Do you, um, Tiff, you want to roll moonbeam damage again for this one? Are you still here? Sorry, who was that? Oh, oh, that's sorry, you. sorry, that's me. Yeah, I rolled another moonbeam damage. Takes Those 18, nines. does not save, is immediately destroyed. Immediately destroyed. And number eight. Same thing. Roll it one more time. <laughs> Ouch. Oh no. What was the save DC? Uh, 15. So it doesn't save. But now it only takes six points of radiant damage and it is still surviving. Your fight has not been. I, I feel like the moonbeam might be flickering out. <laughs> you gotta shake it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hit it. Yeah. Alright, well, this one's still existing and is gonna come over here and flank Katrin and attack. Even with advantage, does not hit. Ara's turn again. Um, Ara's gonna move uh, as soon as this stops freezing. Okay. Um, she can see this one right here, so she is going to magic missile it. For another 14. On the one south of Katrin? Yes. I'm having issues here. Okay, that is enough to destroy it. Woohoo! And that is my turn. Beautiful. Sardic. Sardic will again provoke the spiritual weapon to ram into the foul creatures that would dare attack. And does not hit, sadly. Actually, oh yeah, you don't have advantage, right? No. Yeah, then that's gonna miss. But what else are you gonna do? That's ah, alright. I'll do it myself. And he'll go ahead and ascend the stairs, the Warhammer trailing behind him, and again he'll bring it up and just come send it crashing down. Okay, attacking around that hard corner, I'm going to say it has three quarters cover from you. But you can still attack. Hmm. If he would realize he that that has cover, 
he'll actually kind of step back over here, and he'll just lob a hand axe at it. The only cleric in the world who doesn't have a radiant damage dealing cantrip. E yep. I was wondering about that. <laughs> you step back and do what? Right lob a hand axe at oh, it. Oh, lob a hand axe. Is, now, is this your hand axe that was damaged by the ooze? This is the undamaged hand axe. Right, he has well, two hand axes. Even with some cover, you, you still hit it. What's the plus two? Because of the crit. Oh, yeah, the crit on the other side. Oh, right, so it's really just seven, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's three. You feel like that should have been a killing blow right into the middle of the thing's head, but uh, it resisted your, your axe blade because it's not magical. Number six, it's time for some more sunbeam, moonbeam. Some kind of beam. Jim beam. <laughs> hey, hopefully death beam. I don't know why I just rolled initiative again for this thing instead of... <laughs> oh, it does make the con save, though. Oh, uh, then it takes... So well, it takes... technically, then it takes 12. Yeah, it takes 12, because it takes half and double. Mm -hmm. So it's actually still alive, barely. I fucked up its initiative, though. It's not supposed to be on 17. Let's put it to 7. And it's gonna get the hell out of that moonbeam. And come over here. Also attempt to flank Katrin and attack her in the back. Again, a miss, even with advantage. And number three is the one in the alcove facing off with Katrin, so it'll attack her with flanking. Another miss. They just can't seem to hit her. Okay, Roscoe. Um, Roscoe is going to step up. Um, he had been like sitting there waiting around the corner with his rapier ready to be like, aha! And uh, nothing came around, so he's going to like step out and see that he's missing on the action. Move through here um, to the other side to get flanking with Sardik um, and attack the one below. Okay. So 24, I'll take that one. Hit. Um, and then... 17 reduced to 8 damage to that. That is enough to destroy it. Aha! Uh -huh. um. So it fades out of existence. And then, not that I expect it to do much, but he will take the second dagger from his belt now and um, do kind of like a, a swipe at this one here by Katrin. Uh, just in case something comes up. It does not. Not gonna happen. <laughs> um, and then he's gonna take one step down. Uh, do you know what? Actually, he's gonna step into this alcove. And he's gonna, like, kind of back into it and keep his eyes out. Okay. Midge? Uh, is that one the only one that's left that they have cornered in the alcove? You don't see any more. Actually, did Roscoe when he stepped out here? Because he does have 120 foot dark vision um, going out. There. You didn't see any more. Okay. I'm going to check to see if I can only move Moonbeam to a place I can see. On each of your turns, you can use an action to move the beam 60 feet in any direction. Oh, I can just move it. I'll put it right there. Okay, that's fine. You doing anything else? 
uh, moved up a bit just to get a better line of sight on this hallway, but that. All right, it starts its turn in the moonbeam. Roll the damage. I don't think it matters. I don't think it can possibly survive, even if it makes it save. Yeah, even if it makes a save, it's destroyed. So that's the end of that one. Moonbeam was pretty nice in that fight. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it went from Roscoe being literally three hits from dead from strength save and being like, shit, <laughs> shit, 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 <laughs> uh, um, to, oh. <laughs> so thank you, Midge. That wasn't for you. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I appreciated it. Um, I'm gonna go get my stuff now, which got super heavy for some reason. By the way, now that you guys are in this hallway, I, I could give you a description of what you see in here. Because it is a little bit unusual. Are we out of combat? Yeah, you're out of combat now. Alright, Roscoe recovers his backpack and the um, the dagger that he threw at the one carrion crawler. Um, but he is encumbered right now, so he's like slowly trudging along like very un- So in each of these niches along the hallway, on both sides, are large oval mirrors set in heavy stone frames. And laying in roughly the middle of the hallway is the blackened end of a burnout torch lying on the floor. So anyway, it's Hall of Mirrors. There's mirrors in all these niches is, uh, is the, the takeaway here. If you want to inspect things further, you can, or if you want to leave and do something else, you can. It's now well, uh... out of combat, so you can do whatever you want. So, Katrin comes out of her rage, she's panting and kind of bent over with her hands on her knees. Oh, I think we're expected up north, are we not? We are. Well, I'm sure after all of that, if those, uh, if the Undertakers are still up there, they're aware that we're here. But we were still supposed to go meet them, and if we leave this area, they said that we're not safe. I'd rather have one less enemy. <laughs> <clears throat> that one was a bit hard to read, though. Um, we heard that they were vampires, did we? We did, but if they want to talk to us, and if we leave this area and they attack us, we, like... We're still being messed up. If we go and see what they want, and they're like, hey, you guys can go explore. Just stay the hell away from this, or, you know, don't bring back any of our business. And we won't bother you, and really, really hungry. In that case, I mean, I wouldn't say we have an ally, but we have one less problem to worry about. I would rather... Be looking over my shoulder because I'm paranoid versus looking over my shoulder because there's a vampire stalking us. Don't say the P word around her. Fine. <laughs> and that is the direction of the omen struck pillar. Midge points down uh, in this direction, though, and says, uh, well... I'd still be interested in heading this way. We saw last time the bugbears wearing these, and she pulls out uh, that leather patch that has the Xanathar guild symbol. Uh, the one that was wearing this was running down this hallway. Uh, I, I think I understand that the Xanathar, well, I guess I don't know the Xanathar, that these bugbears were at odds with the, um, the Undertakers up there, so they might be in favor of us going and dealing with the problem. I would rather go see what they want because as we were told, if we leave this area and do not go see them, they will attack us. I am 100% with you. I just mean maybe what they want from us is going back to deal with. Maybe we shouldn't assume what they want. 
I was like super irritated. Like, why would you do that? Don't, don't, don't assume. Well, fair enough. Um, do we want to try and collect some poison from these uh, carrion crawlers? I mean, they hit me with something a bit nasty. I mean, that would be cool. Uh, you could dip your daggers or bolts or arrows. I don't think I would be the best candidate for trying to take it from them, um, but it might be nice to have. Katrin just kind of walks over to the northeast wall of the pillar room and just sits down with her back against the wall after collecting the dagger that she threw. And just she just seems to be resting and waiting for you guys to decide where we're going. Roscoe, are you attempting to do something with these carrying crawler corpses? Um. Uh, hmm. I don't think Roscoe has any training in harvesting poison from creatures, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think the only um, person who'd have any reasonable shot at trying to do that would be Midge. Depends on what kind of check it would be. Uh, but Midge, Midge, so this is her mindset. She personally doesn't think she needs any poison, and she definitely doesn't think any of these people need poison. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's probably I mean, it'd be kind of nice that... Um, I just don't feel quite so confident getting it myself. And it would be what? dangerous harvesting it, because if you screw up, you're going to poison yourself. Midge Maybe gonna, he wants that. Midge is going to pat Roscoe like, like she's trying to be reassuring, but it absolutely is not reassuring. And uh, she's going to say, no, I think you can do this. You got it in you. And I'll cast Guidance if he wants to try. Wait, he's gonna like look really confused at her. It's like, it didn't sound like you wanted me to do it, yet I feel like kind of inspired to do it. Oh, um, didn't it? <laughs> she wants to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, um, Midge, could you at least like sit here and point at the right place and, you know, help me try? Like, you know. I know you just gave me some assistance, but I mean, kind of mechanically from the, like, helping action. <laughs> I can't, you know you're asking for a lot, right? Ara just looks and goes, why can't you just stab, like, your daggers into their poison sack and then sheath them? Uh, it might dry. Ideally, we'd get it into, like, a vial or something. Um, so we could use it whenever we want it. She shrugs and just sits down on the steps. Midge is just going to go up and like pry open one of these things mouths, like making sure not to touch any of the teeth and then look directly at Roscoe and say, well, go ahead. <laughs> if this counts as, um, <laughs> as assistance. On... The sad part is what's not going to be helpful is yeah. I think it's their tentacles, not their bite. I think you're right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what collect, the, what their, collect the poison. What was, the tentacle? <laughs> what was their other attack? It was tentacles. Oh, okay. Yeah, she'll, the just tentacle, hold the head. Well, she'll just hold the head still. Roscoe <laughs> did get hit by the tentacles once and did get attempted to be poisoned. I think he might know that. <laughs> All right. So he just kind of like twists his head and is like, um... Wait a second. Like, <laughs> do you really want help with her? <laughs> Um, That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Do you? I, <laughs> if I'm getting it, so the, the help it's action. It's so hard to like be helpful without being helpful. Like this is really weird. Okay, um, but yeah, no, no, she'll hold I, the head very soon. Will you allow <laughs> that? <laughs> will I allow what exactly? The help action from Midge um, to get advantage on the. Yeah. So you actually are legitimately trying to help him get this poison 
Tef. from its mouth. Um, she's yeah, she's, <laughs> she's she's legitimately trying to help him because she truly doesn't think he'll be able to do. It. So she's like, I mean, it's not it's not gonna hurt me to do okay. this. Then yes, you can roll it with advantage, and you've got guidance as well. It's a nature All right, check. Alright, fingers crossed. Let's see how this goes. Oh, I could have <laughs> rolled that then as a nature check. Oh. oh! What do you mean you weren't good at it? You got a plus four to that. I'm smart, but not nature smart. <laughs> Why would you even roll your guidance, though? Because I want more. <laughs> Alright, a 20 is enough to get some poison. A little bit. And not poison yourself in the process. However... The poison will only be good for an hour. I was going to try and put it in the vial. You have no idea how to, how to preserve it or what to do with it to make it... Like, so you like, don't know how to manufacture a poison product out of this. This is just the raw, you know, venom itself. <laughs> Midge spits in it and says, see if that works. Man, I was just thinking <laughs> that. Like, either spit in it or put some... It in with some blood just to, like dilute now you so can wait. attempt that's one dose that you can get out of one carrier crawler you can try three more times on the other three carrying crawlers if you wish um no, Midge points i would to like to Boston find a way says, no if you if you were trying to get more Midge would say that looks like enough and then walk away. yeah no this is this is all <laughs> i want if it's so wait even if it's like in a um like a vial and stopper and that sort of thing in our that it's going to go bad in an hour. Yeah. All that work for nothing. Uh, well, we have it for an hour. So if you fight something else in the next hour, you can uh, use it. I'm sure it's that is worth the risk. It'll take an action to apply it to your weapon. <laughs> well, we have it. Uh, I'm not going to try my luck anymore. Uh, <laughs> That's an hour in the vial. If you apply it to your weapon, it'll only last a minute. And then to actually make it something stable, it would require something like a poisoner's kit. Kind of. Yeah. Which I do not have, nor the proficiency, nor the capability. So we'll just have a one hour of this poison and see how it goes. <laughs> um, now, about your missing strength. Yes. Fortunately, this is much less harsh than the missing intellect from the intellect devourer. You will regain your strength when you take a short rest. Ah, and I will lose my poison when I take a short rest. <laughs> but yes. Um, yes. Uh, well, I don't know. How's everyone doing right now? I'm a bit weak, but honestly, I... Uh, use finesse more than strength for most things. So it's not the end of the Katrin says, I'm fine. I was a little bit tired, but I feel good now. She's still eating some of that extra food that she brought down from the tavern. <laughs> she seems to be able to eat without too much disturbance, even though there's dead bodies dead carrion crawlers and everything around. It doesn't seem to turn nice. her stomach. Guck and disgustingness. Hmm. Looks like we're good to keep moving that. <laughs> Midge uh, has no to... sympathy for you. I hate to ask this, and I, I promise the books that I would ask someone to carry are not the crazy books. Would someone mind holding on to some of my textbooks for me? <laughs> Just, you know. What is what I'm is your strength with the negative? It is six right now. Oh. I mean, it's good reads. It's stuff on, like, the Undermountain's history, and um, Volo gave me a book signed by him. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got, you know, my, my journal. <laughs> um, but... Uh, if someone wants, they could take my torches. Actually, I'm just going to drop my torches. <laughs> They're just going to stay here. We don't Catherine need says, pounds, I can but... carry some stuff. I'm not carrying much. I can carry some stuff. Uh, I have ten torches <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where Roscoe is keeping ten torches. Um, but um, 
You can keep them if you want them. If not, I'm just gonna leave them here, actually. Oh, I'll take them. She puts them in her pack, along with what looks like ten more torches that she's already got. Let's see what else is weighing me down. Oh, I have a crowbar. Um, I would like this back, actually, later. Um, just, um, you can give her as much stuff as you want, essentially, and she'll carry it. Just keep, we'll keep it on your character sheet. Just note that you're not carrying right, those good. items at this moment. Yeah, the king in yellow is really the only thing Roscoe's definitely keeping on him. But, um, yeah, he, so he's back to not being encumbered then. All right. Katrin says, so we're going to go looking for those vampires? Looks that way. I don't know why they didn't come out to meet us this time. Well, uh, there were a couple of carrion crawlers here. I um, bet they were just giving them some space. Uh, at least, so, maybe. Uh, at this point, you hear singing. And is it good singing? You can see anybody that's still looking down the hallway. It looks like Sardik's still kind of down there. Yeah, Sardik is moving the spiritual weapon back and forth and just watching it like in the mirrors go la 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 la. <laughs> well, it's been it's been how long does that last? Up to a minute? Yeah, up to a minute. Yeah, it's been a lot more than a minute. It took about ten minutes to do the carrion crawler thing. So that's gone. The moonbeam is gone. You see, coming down the hall towards you, what looks like two goblins. And they are not carrying any weapons. They have weapons on them, but they're not carrying them in their hands. And they are just sort of... spoonily bouncing along, singing a song. <laughs> Um, more bodies. What is that? More bodies to add to this room. <laughs> Are they singing in Goblin? Actually, no. They're singing in Common. Oh, okay. Surprisingly. And they are both bedecked. I mean, right now, only Sardik can see them, but they're both bedecked with skulls. Hmm, not an oddly jaunty yet grim and they're, gathering. And they have little, little like drumsticks, and they're playing the skulls that are on their bodies as though they're drums. <laughs> and they're singing. There ain't nothing better than finding skulls. The shiny bone treasure that never dies. Better and tearing the wings off seagulls. We collect <laughs> them all just for the laws. Paralysis and poison affects the voice box too, right? Just to be sure. Wait, what? I'm just teasing. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> I, yes, yes, it does. Oh. I was like, is that a dying cat that can speak common? And they're singing very loudly, so you guys can all actually hear this. Roscoe is going to like kind of quietly look up at um, like Catra and Mijnara who are kind of around and say, uh, is this a friend? Um, we have skulls, and they like to collect them. Oh, I would like, say... What's that? It sounds cute. So she goes wandering down there to see what's going on. Look, I don't think I'll get much use out of this poison if it's not right now. So I'm going to put it on my rake here real quick. Uh -huh. And then, uh, uh start slowly following Catherine after <laughs> So they Mitch up... looks over at Ara. I'm sorry. Yeah, she's just gonna kind of look at Ara.
and they see Sardik. Oh! There's a dwarf there! Yeah, I see him! They seem to have the identical voices. And in fact, they look a whole lot like each other. And, you know, they even have the same sort of accoutrement. They kind of they... sound like they're from New York, too. <laughs> a little bit, yeah! <laughs> In the best way. <laughs> and they have, they have great axes on their backs that are made out of sharpened bone. And they have skulls for helmets, and they have skulls for shoulder pads, and they have skulls on their belt. They're all into the skull motif pretty hard. Oi! Who are you, dwarf? Yeah, who are you? Ah, uh, Sardic Drizzlebeard, just uh, down here from the other day. And who might you be, oh, oh fellows of performance? I'm Pibble! I'm Groin! We're Pibble and Groin! Famous <laughs> goblin skull hunters! I know you heard of us, right? I have the book. Have I heard of them? <laughs> There's nothing about these goblins in the book. Okay. Uh, I think they're pulling our chain here. Roscoe, like, whispers to, um, to Catrin, who's, like, right next to him. Probably not loud enough for Sardis. So, what does Sardik say anything to them? Or anybody say anything to them? Uh, no, I don't think I have, but... Uh, but the Blessed Mother, the, the Dancer of Fortune, she appreciates all sorts of dance and song and performance. We like to sing and play the skull drums! Because we're having fun! We're looking for skulls! Oh! Notices the dead bugbears. There's some skulls. Can we have those? Is there yes. a skull left, though? Yeah, I mean, the carrion crawlers were eating the flesh off the bugbears, but... They no, I, I meant that one was charred and then an intellect devourer came out of it, didn't it? Oh yeah, a couple of them did have intellect to burst out of their skulls, so the skulls are definitely badly damaged. Do carrion crawlers have skulls? I, was I don't wondering. know they're an ad. Uh, no, I'd say they don't. They're like a giant centipede. Yeah, they're, they have a more like, like a chitinous type of thing rather than actual bones. I mean, what's the intelligence of a goblin? We might be able to pass this one off. It's like an outside skull. Or we could point out the the that wasn't there like a Kenku skull or something oh, yeah. back in the other stairway. So Katrin kind of walks up closer. Hi, I'm Katrin. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not gonna try to take your skull. I mean, not yet. If we find you dead, then yeah, definitely taking it. Don't worry! I know we look fearsome and scary, and you're probably very intimidated by us, says <laughs> Groin. And then Pibble cuts in. But we ain't with them, uh, them other goblins. Them, them, them salmon, uh, what do they call them? The... What? Xanaram or... Xanath? Yeah, them! We're not with them! So, you know... Where, uh, where would those operators. other ones... Where would those other goblins be? Oh, they're south of here! Around the corner! Is that their... their main hideout? Is that where the, the whole Xanathar guild is? I don't know. We haven't been a lot of places in here yet. So they walk up and they start like 
they start like scraping the flesh and hair off of the head of this bugbear lang right here. Look, looking like they've done this many a time in the past. Anyway, we're not gonna do anything to you if you don't do anything to us. Which you shouldn't, because we're really tough. You look and it. And Groin says, "Yeah, we killed that a sounds... dragon." Do they have uh, a dragon so skull on them anywhere? Turns, yeah, he turns around, and on his back, there is what looks like the skull of a small dragon. Um, so. We did kind of make these skulls for you, um, and we could maybe point you in the direction of some more. Have you got anything for trade or anything? Uh, not really. Eh, that's fair. Um, you know what, though? We know a secret. Yeah, we know a secret. But we're not just going to tell you for nothing. Well, what's the cost in skulls for this secret? A lot of skulls! How many do you think, Groin? I don't know, Pibble? Maybe... He's like counting on his fingers. <laughs> uh, divide by five! Carry Midge would interject me. as he's doing this math. Um, how about the skulls of whatever goblins are uh, to the south? Not enough! We need at least 50 skulls! What about super rare ones or exciting ones rather than just, you know? Um. Yeah. You know, Ara's gonna go over to where the Kenku is and see if she can detach that skull. No, we don't want the skull off that thing! Why not? Only skulls with a certain shape! That one's got a bad shape! Oh, um... We don't want skulls from weird monsters either! We want it from people! Why people? Why not weird monsters? Weird monsters are more exotic. Their skulls are... It shows that you're you're more powerful and you're more intimidating and you're more scary. The scarier the skull, the scarier you could be because you took down that monster to get the skull. No, uh, those are out right now in the skull fashion world. Yeah, but humans are measly, says the drow. <laughs> Even this dragon skull, I wouldn't be pulling it around unless, you know, but we killed it ourselves, so we gotta have proof, but... Not even the I dragon mean, skull is the kind of skull we want. I'm impressed by your dragon skull. Way more than I would be by ten human skull. Humans are weak. You killed a dragon. A dragon. Well, Do you I mean, know how hard it is to kill a dragon? Humans, elves, dwarfs, uh, goblins, orcs. I, not kobolds, though. No, their skulls are stupid. Oh, what do you intend to do with these skulls? That's for us to know and you to not find out. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, I feel put in my place right now. Catrin uh... says, I don't know how we could find that many skulls. I mean, we'll probably end up killing some things while we're here and get a few skulls, but she looks at the dead bodies and what they're doing with this cobalt, this bugbear's head in disgust. I don't know, I for one, and she looks back at everybody else in the group, I for one am not gonna harvest skulls. That's gross. Well, I mean, they can keep their secret then. She, now she's trying to use a reverse psychology. We'll collect the really cool skulls, and when we go back up in the surface, we can show people, like, what we're made of. Oh, and they're the gonna skull? Be like, the human skull collecting goblins? <laughs> Look at these people, they have all types of monsters. Well, in the skull, skull fashion industry, it was really uh, born out of Waterdeep, as well as the trendsetters are. And, uh, you know, we were just up there a little bit, and uh, I think I think 
Carrion Crawler was uh, one of the new trends here. Make a deception check. <laughs> that was really me being more like bantering. Um, if Aura wants to try and convince them, I, I can um, make the deception check if you want. Well, I was gonna try for persuasion with the whole like measly humans, all these monsters. Like I don't oh want to take goodness. that away from her because it was kind of the thing that she was working on. <laughs> I was just trying to be funny, really. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I will roll if you want me to, but I don't want to take that away from you. You don't want to what? I was just trying to make jokes. Uh, <laughs> I, Mando, I think, was actually trying to convince some of things. I can roll a deception check if you would like me to, um, but I think she well, was the one of, trying to like head off. Both of you can roll. Oof. All right. All right. Uh, well, he, they do make a good point. Yeah, maybe. Well, we might. We might take some other skulls, I guess. Well, I mean, they're right here. Um, why don't you give us some of that information? No, this isn't enough. So, what happens if we find fifty skulls and uh, your information's not? Then we've harvested 50 skulls. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll be really grateful. Besides, our information leads to treasure. That uh, Ara thinks about that for a second because treasure to them is skulls. So, how about this? Uh, you can follow us around. Uh, and if we kill the thing, and you take the skull, that counts towards our running 50, yeah? I mean, don't follow us around, like, everywhere. That'd be a bit weird, but... I mean, they could follow us around. They're pretty scary. They could probably save us. They slayed a dragon. And I, like, kind of... I kind of pinch Roscoe's arm, like... Come along oh. with me on this. Oh, yeah, we need... Uh, you know, that would... We, we do need some, uh, fantastic performers. Yeah, war music. You could sing for us while we slay and collect your skulls. We ain't gonna do that. We got serious stuff to do. We can't be we can't be gallivanting around with silly humans and elves and shit. She she gives them a very sad look and she's like, That's Honestly, sad. all you all you non goblins are too spoony. I mean, do you see how many dead bodies there are in here? We did yeah. that. So at this point, they're kind of moving over to inspect the other bugbear bodies. Ah, uh, this one, the skulls are too damaged. No good. That wasn't our fault. We'll give you Here. credit for that one in the hole, though. So you need 49 more from us. Look, we roam around a bit, but... We kind of made our camp in a little room just uh, just to the north of this long hallway. You can find okay. us there easy, probably. All right, well, I think that we should stop wasting our time then and, you know, head on, guys. Uh, they, they can't really help us, and they're kind of expecting yeah. more than what we're willing to give. Or no, have. seriously, what are we doing? I mean, I'm not down here to collect treasure from little goblins, so let's go talk to those vampires. Yeah, okay. All right, see you later, Pimble and Groin, famous goblin skull hunters. Roll out! Uh, yeah, I read about them. <laughs> Y'all in uh, my book. <laughs> Don't, so they, you're just gonna wanna see it. <laughs> they start heading down the hallway toward the well room where you came from and they start they take up their song again there ain't nothing mm. better than finding skulls the shiny bone treasure that never does better and turn wings off seagulls we collect them all just for the loss and they just yes. go about their <laughs> business that was Leaving. amazing applaud them
leaving you. I can't you, applaud and hit my push stop. Leaving you free to continue your journey to the north, but this is a good place to stop for the night. <laughs> so we're gonna leave it here. Next time you can actually finally go to the north and hopefully find those vampires. Yeah, we've had a lot of combat in that little pillared room. Yeah, that's that room is like a death trap. It's a bloodbath <laughs> in there. Yeah. For everything that encounters us. We also didn't do anything about the bodies again, except for one skull. So, uh... Wait until but, like, see what are we gonna do? The carrion giant, crawlers. You know, just like carrion. drag them into the like the sludge room. <laughs> the now it's gonna be like a purple worm or something. Um, I think if it's a purple worm, we just stay up there with the vampires. Yeah, I don't think you guys are ready for a purple worm. Maybe it'd be a pretty deadly encounter though. Okay, so anyway, yeah. When we, when we come back next time, we'll uh, just continue right from here, and you can head to the north and do your thing. Let's see about time tracking. I... You spent about three hours of randomness in the tavern before you came down. You haven't Everything really else been was in round. down here that long, but I'll say everything included, you've spent an hour down here now. Which means Midge is down to 13 hours, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. Almost, I mean, 13 hours remaining. Just another uh, 15 sessions, and I'll be out of this. Who even was Midge? Well, to <laughs> be fair, no, you get I to was sleep Midge eight was hours. Normal of... Midge for one session. I know. I feel like uh, like there's gonna be like some permanent damage for her. Just cause I can't remember, yeah. Yeah, cause you have no idea what happened while you were possessed. Losing memory is a pretty strange thing. Well, this isn't possession, right? Like this current madness. It's not gonna be like when she snaps out of it, she has 30 hours of missing memory. No, 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 no. You're not possessed now, no. Okay, 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 good. Um, okay, so at this point, I will go ahead and end my episode for YouTube real quick. So that's going to do it for this one, everybody. Thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays Dungeons & Dragons. This is Dungeon of the Mad Mage Beneath the Yawning Portal. We'll see you next time.